just a quick introduction to us. So Neil and myself, both teachers to start with, a very long time ago now, and then individually decided that we needed to find out more about how to help children who are vulnerable, who are not thriving, who made us go home at night scratching our heads or sometimes uh, spending a lot of time being anxious about those children. So we went into the British Health Service, so to work in the health service, first of all as teachers, and then we trained as uh, systemic psychotherapists and became consultants in the health service. And we thought we would look there for the very best mental health for children and bring it back to school. Uh, and that took us a long time, 30 something years, a long time exploring. So there we worked with psychologists, with psychiatrists, with social work, trying to understand how do you help children who are the most vulnerable and to give them the very best education. So in the health service, we set up something called family groups. Uh, and that's right, we went to, uh, to Denmark and we went to Sweden and we went to Norway, first time Finland, and shared the concept and the method. The method. And in each country, of course, it's a development in a community. Is my English okay? Okay, thank you. Just checking. <laughs> the development in the community. So it, it, it is slightly different in Swedish, slightly different in Norwegian, slightly different. We've just come back from Germany. Again, big development of multifamily in schools. Again, slightly different because it will take on the culture of the community. So we're very much looking forward to seeing what Finnish multifamily looks like, because it will be different. But I think what we hope to give you today is uh, the very um, skeleton, the very good basic structure of how it works. We have, as well as us being here, um, an online training now. We spent time thinking, uh, because you can't reach everybody in the UK or Denmark all the time, how do we, how do we make it work? So we have a, a login and you have over two hours of film of seeing people run groups. You have some background theory and you have some things that you can download to help run the group. So um, if we get boring this afternoon, you can just switch off because then you can log in. Hear us all again later. Um, with the online, there is also a manual uh, and uh, with our friends in Switzerland and Denmark and Norway, sometimes we Skype and how's it going? And then there's a question, I had a father and he said, mm, what should I do? So um, going back to your point, I hope that this is a conversation that we will continue to have and we'll be excited to see how you develop your groups. But the basic premise is, uh, because we started life as teachers, that children who are dist distressed and have a difficult time every day being able to focus, concentrate, feel secure that... <laughs> What's happening? Oh, wow. <laughs> Is this like uh, in the White House? <laughs> Lockdown. Okay, right. <laughs> um, that children who find it difficult because they don't feel secure or they find it hard to trust adults do not have what we call a super highway to learning. They have a difficult journey to learning because they don't feel secure with the teacher. They don't have good, I don't know what this is in Finnish, but peripheral vision. They, they can't see broadly. They are tunnel vision. And the more stressed they are, the more tunnel vision. And so they have a less opportunity with friends, less opportunity with work. So what we will share with you today is what we have found out in the world of child mental health that we've adapted, brought into the classroom. And this is uh, really important for us, working with the family, working with parents. And that was quite difficult because in Britain, there's a lot of prejudice Bad children means bad parents. 
<laughs> so to change that um, has been a lifetime's work and our biggest excitement for us is that three years ago we opened a school, a regular school, not a special school, not multi-family groups going into school for a small part of the day, but a school that takes 40 children and families uh, who are vulnerable and that is their school and working with them and we have just had our government come and look at our school and given us a, a judgment and we got the highest judgment which is amazing uh, not for us but for the idea of parents being supported to help their children learn the impact that we had to prove that we did is that when you bring parents into school and you train parents to support children's minds that the academic progress does that make sense you, you Finn, you are amazing with academic process <laughs> we know that you get highest marks in england our children that came to our school they they don't make that journey they just stay flat so we had to prove that by bringing in parents and some technique, we could help those children make the same progress that any other child in the UK. And that's what we're extremely excited about because um, mostly our children stay flat. Then they're a problem for youth justice. They're a problem for social care. They're a problem for prison service, drugs and alcohol service. So they're a very expensive and very sad option so we hope that we can turn that around so for example we have a, a child who is 14 and he had had 22 families to live with 22 placements does that make sense you have in foster care here yeah so his mother and father had domestic violence and then he was moved and he said you know if you are naughty when you are nine and you trash your room Basically, your parents decide to, uh, I don't know what the finish is, but ground you, keep you in, no going out. But if you're in care and you trash your room, you are, all your clothes go in a black bin liner, put outside the door, call social services, and off you go again. So, you know, his example of opportunities for life was poor. I mean, he's been in our school, he's now gone back to mainstream regular school, and he's back living with his mum. And I think that's what we hopefully have been over all these years trying to do, to create the best context for children to thrive. So that has to be their internal context, but the systemic context of family as well. So that's it briefly, and we're gonna show you a little bit of film, but it'd be good to go around and find out what your expertise is uh, and where you fit into this. Hopefully we'll know more. Where shall we start? We know you. <laughs> I'm gonna pass this around. Should I start? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, hi and good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Hanne Kalmari. I come from uh, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health and I'm the project manager of this LAPE program. And I had uh, the pleasure to listen to Brenda earlier this year uh, in the spring, and I'm so happy to have you both here. Um, I enjoyed it, and I'm sh quite sure that you will too. Hello, I'm Senja Hirsservi, and I'm from this LAPE program as well. We were just wondering what the heck it is in, in English, but it's a LAPE program, apparently. And, uh, and I'm in charge of the Central Finland's um, progress in education, early education and education. So that is my contribution to this. I'm bringing the message back to the Central Finnish people, and I'm losing my voice, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marita Lenske, and I come from Valtteri Center for Learning and Supervising. And I work as a special class teacher uh, in Valtteri School. Hello, I'm Susanna Huldin. I come from the same place, and I'm a rehabilitation instructor for visually impaired children. 
Hello, my name is Marit törmykoski hanf and I come from the same school and I'm working as a social worker there. Yes, hi, my name is uh, Sanna Karvin and I'm a psychiatric nurse and work in a psychiatric clinic here in Helsinki. Hi, my name is Katri Rinne. I'm coming from Valtteri also and we don't know each other because I'm coming from... I'm from Kuopia, from Mandukangas, and I'm a special education teacher. And one more person from Valtteri, from Valtteri Onerva, from Jyväskylä, the middle um, Finland, central Finland, same part, and uh, I'm a school social work. Hello, my name is Lena Normi Alsten. I come from uh, National Institute for Health and Welfare. And I work with this uh, Finnish family center model. And before I started this job, I was social worker too. Hello, my name is Sari Valima. I come from the southern part of Finland and I'm working with this LAPE. LAPE program also. Originally, I'm a principal on the primary level. Okay, hello, my name is Ria Palmqvist. I work as a counselor of education. I'm a, a Kristina's colleague from the National Agency for Education. And it's great to be here and, and I look really forward to hear what you have to <laughs> at the program. Yes, my name is Kristina Leitinen and as Ria told, we work in the same National Education Authority here in Helsinki. And, and I'm in charge of welfare issues in schools. Uh, and Jukka Mäkel, I'm a, a child psychiatrist and, and psychotherapist by training and uh, have always been interested in, in how to bring uh, promotive and preventive mental health services to, to where people live, where, where children go in their everyday, through their everyday life. So uh, I was, uh, from the moment I heard about the family schools, I was thinking that this is something that we can we can bring and create uh, a a way of, of of working with it. And I like Han, I was had the pleasure to meet with you in in London. So I'm Neil Dawson. I've uh, Brenda and I have worked for um, a very long time together. So over thirty five years. Uh, so uh, some marriages don't last as long. I know. So. <laughs> I think the question after a while, uh, if you know Brenda and I, people say, are they married? And they say, yes, yes we are, but to different people. So, <laughs> as you gather, I've just had a granddaughter today, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I think just the, the it, it's the passion really from um, the origins of working in schools where um, knowing children who were struggling and uh, doing all the best you could as teachers and then seeing some progress during the week and then seeing in the, on the Monday that after the weekend that things were back to square one and that you'd done all the best you could and um, things didn't stay changed and I think as soon as uh, we met together, again in terms of the English system, we met in a health service. So Brenda and I, by different routes, I taught in a, a primary school, so for uh, 10 and 11 year olds, um, for a short time. We ended up in a special place in the health service where we were very fortunate to be uh, at the very beginnings of family therapy in the, in the UK. So it had spread from America, so this was in uh, 1980. And so all the top family therapists were coming to London and uh, they were selling their wares and they were practicing in, in different countries before they spread across Europe and Scandinavia. Um, so we were very, very lucky, I think. It was, a, it was an accident, but as teachers for us to experience, we were on my first day at uh, the, the Marlborough Family Service, I, I was told, well, you are responsible for a family. You are going to uh, be the... Uh, you recognize this, be a clinician for, for, for the family to be responsible for all their therapy. I thought, but I'm a teacher, I'm a primary school teacher, I'm, what, what do I know? And very quickly I knew what I didn't know. 
Um, but it was a, a very rich immersion in the family therapy world at its big, very beginnings. And uh, so we saw, both of us saw, uh, separately and together, the dramatic changes that could be brought about by working via the family. And so we um, got very uh, good input and became family psychotherapists. So that's our, our dual qualification is as teachers and we are consultant psychotherapists. Uh, but our challenge has always been, how do you apply any of the uh, family system, systemic practice to the um, school setting? So um, we can do and have done and continue to do uh, what would be classed as regular family therapy. But our excitement and passion has always been to say, how do you apply it to the school setting? Now when we first um, saw change, it's all got uh, thrilled by the process, we, um, well, I'm, I'm just deciding which story to tell because the... Yeah, we could go on for some time, which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll Should save the other one for later, but yeah. It, it, the, 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 yeah, look at the PowerPoint in a second, but, it, but I think it, it was talking to our colleagues in schools and all the time saying, they would first said to us, well, it's all very well for you at your specialist centre. How do you actually engage parents in um, working together collaboratively? And uh, gradually over time, we, in our first setting, it was a multifamily classroom that we created right at the beginning, saying we, we brought one parent into the, into the classroom and thought, well, that's interesting. It seems to be significant. But then we brought another one. Gradually, we built up the idea of working in a group of families and thought, you saw the excitement of that. But then trying, after many years of doing that, then the, our local area, like your thinking, said, well, that's very nice, but you're working in your specialist center with nine or 10 families at a time. There are far more children and families who are struggling in school than you can possibly ever manage. So that's when we developed the idea of the family group or family cluster. There are many different names for it across Scandinavia and Britain. So family group is equivalent to a family class, I think. So, but working in the regular system, in the regular school, where um, children aren't required to have a diagnosis, they're not required to go to a clinic, uh, where working with colleagues in the school system, in the school is actually creating a once a week program where parents and children uh, come together in a group uh, with two members of staff, and we saw dramatic change from that. So, uh, and Brenda was saying earlier, then we've developed on to create our own school, which is a, a massive undertaking. I can't uh, say how big that has been. That's been five years' work, and it's a very dramatic move on in terms of scale as to how big this has become. So the UK government and everybody is becoming very interested in that, especially as Brenda said, we got a, uh, the word is outstanding result for the inspection, so that uh, it's unheard of. So it's. Uh, so there are different levels of intervention which we'll talk about, but all the time at the base of it is a child who's struggling, a child who's not managing very well uh, emotionally, behaviorally, relationally, uh, mental health wise, uh, but showing it through their uh, poor performance in school, so they'll be underachieving quite commonly. Uh, but using, bringing the families into school, creating what we would define as an accessible form of help where they're not necessarily required to go to a clinic or uh, sadly to see a psychiatrist or, or a psychologist. It's, uh, it's, it's that sort of route. So that's the basis of, our, of all of our practice over a very long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's lovely when you work with somebody for so long that they 
um, I get to the end of my speech and Brenda says, just keep talking, just, just say some more. Um, what would I say next, Brenda? I would say... What are you yeah. talking about a little bit about yeah. what are the challenges what, that you have yeah. in your school? Because that would be really helpful. Yeah. It, it, it's sort of, as much as anything, it's what do you want to know from us? What, 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 are, you, what are your concerns? Uh, hey, let's do it. Anybody can uh, speak in Finnish, yeah. and and then we can uh, work with two languages. I, I'll try to translate. Or oh, Christina is is uh, an old English teacher. She can do that. I mean, I, I can prop things because I, I would imagine your first um, concern, or a very common concern, is uh, how do you persuade parents to come to groups? Because there's, there's a lot of skepticism about the idea of getting groups of parents together, because. Um, it is an odd thing to do because when a, in the family terms, when you have a child who behaves in a difficult way, uh, it, it, you tend to become more isolated. So the idea is, or the experience from a parent often is, is feeling blamed, criticized, shamed by the whole process and not invited to anything locally. Uh, or, by, or, or parents will be pointing fingers at them or teacher, they feel like pe teachers are. So you're actually tr bringing together a group of people who normally would be apart. And so there are, uh, it, I mean, we will show you, and it depends how long we talk together, but there are techniques for bringing people together. Uh, but it's recognizing that you are going counter to the normal process that where difficult behavior drives <laughs> people apart. And one of the major um, pieces of feedback that we receive from parents once they've been in a group for a while is saying, I was a bit unsure what I was coming to to begin with. I was a bit nervous. But the sooner I met other parents in the group, I was reassured because there were other people in the same boat. So it's always that same metaphor of people saying. Um, and they, uh, Brenda was pointing out before the idea that um, for many parents uh, and the children themselves, the uh, notion of trust has been lost. So they felt criticized and lost confidence in themselves. So we'll also lose, have lost confidence or trust in professionals often as well, where uh, when you've had a child who's uh, been struggling for a long time, teachers will have said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, your, your child is a problem. And so they have repeating experiences of being uh, failures. So it, it's not a happy experience. So, yeah, I'll move out of the way, yeah. We'll just take you through some thoughts. Okay, so we'll, we'll just take you through some thoughts as to how this come about, and then we'll show you some film. Um, Take you from the training. <laughs> this, um, the PowerPoint, you, you have it. So I'm very happy that you all have the PowerPoint. We can share that with you. Um, okay, so the multi family group is essentially us trying to bring together the worlds of social work, mental health, and education in one model always with the idea of helping a child go from not coping to coping to thriving. So you are trying to do that with a supportive network of family. So we started, uh, as you've heard, because the number of children in the UK who have a, uh, they reach the threshold where people would say, this child deserves something for their mental health they don't get the support that they need. Now, that may be because the support isn't there, the money isn't there, or it may be that the parents are saying, well, there's nothing wrong with my child. It's that teacher that needs to change. It's that school that needs to change. So there may be belief systems. Many of our parents fear that if they say, I'm not coping with my child, then the social services will come and make a judgment and take the child away. So that there's a stigma and an anxiety about saying, I really don't understand my child. And many of the parents that we've met over the years will say, I've got five children, four, fantastic. One, I don't know. <laughs> so this idea that um, they should seek help for their parenting 
when they think, as a parent, I've done very well with four, but number five, something's wrong. So how do we create an environment that is continually curious, that doesn't make a prejudice decision, and is, um, I don't know what the Finnish word would be, but non-stigmatizing, doesn't carry the stigma of, uh, there's something wrong with your child or there's something wrong with your family. So as very small number of uh, families get help, there was a big, um, uh, a big research project recently done by the London School of Economics that worked out that 90%, 90% of the country's, um, the, 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 the burden of the country's money for children who are failing is, is picked up by schools. Now, schools don't get 90% of money to deal with the mental health of children. They have to find the money from what they have from mathematics or Swedish or whatever. But they do carry the burden because that's, going back to your point, that's where families are, that's where schools are, that's where children are. Um, but our schools up until now have been uh, very stretched and stressed as to how to pick up this enormous burden uh, where we've got only one quarter of the children getting help. So, my mic a bit low, I'm okay. <laughs> so the main aim of this uh, approach uh, is to reduce problematic behaviors and to improve the well-being of the children and young people, both in the family and in the school. We're looking at the two areas in which the child learns this idea of epistemic, the idea of learning to trust, which we'll go into a little bit more in a minute. But um, as you can see from the child in the bottom corner, one of our children, uh, constantly checking with mum, should I trust this person? Should I trust what this uh, teacher or this therapist has to say to me? Do I even trust my mum? Do I trust the mood I think my mum is in now? So this uh, helping families discover and rediscover the skills and strengths that they have to support their children to perform better. And working alongside other families who've got similar experience. So our families will say, it's great, you tell me, you're a professional, I kind of believe you, but if you tell me and you have a child the same age and I know you've had similar problems, you are living proof. So as living proof, I will be able to, t to pick up ideas that you have better than if you tell me directly. So that indirect living proof has been really essential. And when we talk to parents about what makes the group work for you, they say other families that are in the same boat, because then I feel I'm not alone. Also, once you've got your group going, families are graduating and new families come in with this idea of, I don't know what this is, I don't know why I'm here, uh, I don't know what I can expect. And then they'll hear some success stories of other families who are leaving, and that gives hope for change uh, and also a, a sort of recognizable pathway for them. So once you've got your first group going, the group dynamic itself makes an awful lot of difference to the engagement of families and then the motivation. And there are three things that our research has told us we need to put into our groups because a lot of our children come with this definition of conduct disorder. So does you have conduct disorder here? Okay. <laughs> and most of our children come with a mixed, a mixed diagnosis anyway, mixed profile. But we, need, we have to put in motivation, we have to rebuild trust, and we have to get some warmth back into the relationships because mostly it's been high criticism and low warmth, and children don't thrive in that. We know from um, talking to our fellows in uh, psychiatric clinics that if you really want a child to actually go backwards once they've left your clinic and need to be readmitted, make sure they go to a family where there's high criticism and low warmth, and very soon they're back in the clinic. So we need to change that around. Um, and so that's part of warmth, motivation, and trust. And that, that begins to create the, um, the opportunity to tackle those problems. So what we're looking at is educational exclusion and social exclusion. 
those two things hand in hand which push our children to the margins. And quite often our children, like the little boy I told you about, you wouldn't say there's something wrong for his brain. What you would say is that he has been struggling to deal with the violence that he saw, that he heard, that uh, a confusion about where he felt safe, and then a feeling of constant rejection, which is a complicated set of circumstances for him, and not one that's easily put under diagnosis. So the children that uh, we have in groups, what who benefits? Those who you've got that persistent disruptive behavior, so chronic uh, verbal and physical aggression, hyperactivity, constant, you know, it ha has my child, what do you call it in Finnish? It's not ADHD here, is it? It's you use the same, you're not hardy hardy history, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so the ADHD question, the poor impulse control, um, the concentration uh, and fluctuating attention skills, anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicide, uh, learning blocks, erratic school attendance and school refusal. Mostly that covers who comes into family group and some of those you would fit as easily on the parent as you would on the child. So you're feeling with multiple generations of failure and that's by bringing them together. You begin to hopefully change the future for the next generation. Okay, so what do our children look like? They have uh, powerful emotions at times, which is what makes them different uh, from their peers that they can't control. They are not able to see themselves as others see them. They're poor mentalizers. They're not able to read other people quite often. Circumstances have not given them a, a trusted internal template for being able to read others. They find it difficult at times when their stress level is high to pay attention to other people's feelings and thoughts uh, and then they get confused because they can't make sense of others or themselves. Uh, they try and control things in a way that the teacher or their peers finds difficult. Uh, that becomes frightening, uh, frustrating and distressing behaviours which again feeds the powerful emotion. So that cycle is normal for the children that come into family group. Does that make sense in, this, in your experience too? Yeah? Okay, so just one of the things we talk about the impact. How do we know that this works, having done it for a very long time? Hope it does. Um, we would had some research, and the research showed that we got improvements in the mental health and well-being of the child through this model that there was an improvement in their pupil rate of progression, the blocks to learning moved and children started to learn and thrive. And we had improvements in social competence, their capacity to manage their internal state control, their emotional regulation. And I'll explain how we make that the curriculum. But basically, when we looked at the families in the multifamily groups and we had control groups, where they had therapy, but in a short, um, short period of time. 12 months later, we still had change in the multifamily group children. And we suspect that that's because you are producing a system that can problem solve and manage each other's emotions. That's the ambition, as opposed to the uh, other children that had a good relationship with the therapist, but after a while, um, the, that didn't sustain in school. It might have been okay in terms of their family, but not in school. Okay, so sorry about this, there's lots of bits, but <laughs> these are the main things that we know work if you run a group. So we know that you create that solidarity. We are all in the same boat. If you come and visit us in London and you see our families together, you will be impressed uh, by the warmth and the feeling of togetherness that they create. And lots of the families say, we're like a family now, as opposed to individuals being quite isolated and, and um, uh, trying to solve problems on their own. So overcoming the stigma, um, we're not the only ones with these problems. They stimulate new perspectives. Ah, I can see clearly now some of the things um, that, that we can do, uh, and up until now maybe I've, I've been a bit blind. 
they learn from each other. I like the way that uh, others manage this. And, and we've noticed that, that many times there may be a conversation with one family and then you'll see two other families actually picking up the ideas. So somehow it not being directed at you, it's easier to kind of, oh, I'll try that. Um, so your intervention is much more effective across a number of families. Um, there's a positive use of group pressure. Families have told us that they, um, they like us professionals, but sometimes they don't tell us the truth. <laughs> yes, I kept him in. Yes, 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 I, I don't let him onto the internet. No, 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 no. And they have a, like a deal with their child, you know, we'll tell them that, that's fine. Um, and <laughs> we had a, a group in Denmark where there was a, a, a boy and he was, um, he was like a goth who spent all his time on the world, in the world of the internet. He didn't have much outside time. And part of the group pressure was for him to step a little outside of the world of the internet and begin to be in the world. And his mum wanted him to be um, more independent. And he, he had her in a good place because he could be on his computer. And then he could go Coke and Coca-Cola would arrive in his hand. It was quite, you know, quite fantastic. So she wanted that to change. Um, and so they told the group that the boy was now delivering the newspapers in the community. Do you have that still? We have it a little bit where the boys go out and they, or girls, and they deliver newspapers. And if we had been one therapist, one family, we'd have gone, that's fantastic, well done. And you know, you've got your own money now and how wonderful. But then another child in the group said, excuse me, uh, I saw your mum put the paper through our door, you know. <laughs> so suddenly, uh oh, you know, we couldn't have the same kind of collusion uh, with the parent that the child was normally having. So there's something about the group able to uh, put a little pressure on each other. But we do, we do talk to the group about maintaining some sense of confidentiality and protecting each other. Um, from from information going outside the group. Okay, um, so we get that mutual support and feedback, uh, competence, uh, raising hope, I think is another important one, and practicing new behaviors in a safe place. As you're here, we have a planning action reflection model. And the action model is like trying out new behaviors uh, on in an, un, um, in a sort of, an idea of research rather than now you have to be perfect. Okay, um, and building in reflection and self-reflectiveness. Mm -hmm. Right, shall we see if this works on here? If not, I'll just describe this while Brenda's setting up. This is a, um, we, you won't know, but we've been promising. I've got sound. No, no, no. no we haven't got sound for this. Yeah, we need a sound. I'll, whilst this is being sorted out, I'll just explain what it is. Um, we've been promising an online training for many years. And uh, so we've been delighted to do this because of the amount of traveling that we've done over many years. We, we, we first went to Denmark in about 2000, so we've been uh, helping to set things up there. And uh, the, the idea of trying to create a remote training when it's got uh, with as much as we know about uh, how to set up a multifamily class plus uh, illustrative film. So the two hours of film was made in a a regular school in, in London, an area of London, where we had just trained the teachers in how to uh, run the groups. Trained the teachers and uh, they worked alongside the psychologists. So, um, just again, so any future thinking you might have about uh, doing this is that uh, I, we designed a program that if you see a therapy program or a therapy training, it's more about the uh, children and families where you're looking at what's going on between members of the family. So the 
lot of time is spent on analyzing and looking at relationships. For our training, we've focused on what the group leaders are doing. So the children and families who are participating, you do see things happening. The discussion isn't about that, it's about what opportunities are there for the, the staff members who are leading the groups. What might they see, what might they think, what might they, what choices might they make in terms of what position to take, what activities to do, and uh, what the structure is. Um, again, just to, whilst that's going on, the um, Brenda said it, we have a planning action and reflection program. We've got, um, it's actually longer than that, it's, a, it's now a T-P-A-R-T, -T, so it's a targets planning action, reflection and transfer. The crucial bit being the transfer because one of the key elements of any program of therapeutic help, uh, particularly in schools, is that uh, research has shown that programs can be very good um, in themselves uh, and may bring about change. But also research shows that a lot of programs are not effective over time. Um, because once the program finishes, then the change isn't sustained. So what we've been trying to focus on so much is the transfer element of a program, that if a group is established in school, um, it's no good if the group operates in isolation. It has to be part of the school system to be affect the, the whole school system. So the, whatever happens in the group has to be exported from the group into the, into the regular classroom and the main part of the school, and of course the family at home. So the T for transfer, the last part, is all the time thinking about how to transfer any change. So this, the group are, is a good place to initiate change, to promote change, to establish change, but it must be transferred into another setting, or the dominant setting. Where have you got to? Not there yet. Not there yet. <laughs> um, which bit would be the next use. Yeah, good, go on. Go on. Uh, probably in this film, but I wonder, how do you get the parents there during the day, or do you have night school? Because no, we most don't. Of our parents are working. Yeah, a lot of our parents are working, or they would say they're working, and they, I mean, it's a big drive from our government that everybody should be working. Um, one of the messages that we have from parents is that uh, because of the level of problems that their children present, that they can't work, that they, I mean, the parents, particularly the ones in our, our school, which are at the very complex end of the spectrum, which um, majority are, would be defined as conduct disorder or oppositional defiance disorder, really, really serious um, struggling families or children and families. Uh, they would, their stories are that they, um, the parents say, well, I would drop my child at school and then uh, I would just go to the cafe over the road because it wasn't worth me going home because I knew I was going to get a phone call within 10 minutes from the school saying he or she is behaving so badly you must come and pick them up and take them home. So that's at the extreme end, but at the, even a lesser end, many of our families are being called by professionals all the time and uh, they are call, required to go to meetings and can't hold down a job. So they, they don't manage very well. So I think one of the, you know, from a government side of things, one of the bonuses is that, because um, we, we're looking at a child who's presenting with difficulties, so that's our primary target through the uh, working with the school system. But obviously we are trying to change the whole system for the family, we have a family-based program, so for a child to change, we need the family to change. Uh, and once a child starts to perform better, be happier, more successful and settled in school, then the parent has to then think about, can think about their own lives. And most of our parents will say, I can now concentrate, I can now think about either going back to college to train or going and go out back on to work. So in economic senses, it, it's a massive bonus for society because you've got somebody who has not, uh, not been performing who can now perform. So there is a tension between uh, requirement of being in the program. That's why, um, again, across Europe, there are different versions of the family group as to whether there's a minimal one of a two hours a day, two hours a week, to 
this one session, which most families can do a, a, a negotiation to get away from work. Or family schools or family classes in, in Denmark, there's some are two, three days a week, or maybe three hours at a time. Um, and they're, they're, the family themselves would be um, assessing uh, what, how much time can they invest in this. So there is a degree from, uh, from the families of balancing out uh, I'm, clearly I need the money and um, society requires me to work. I also have my child care responsibilities. And we have it with our family school at the moment. We have parents who, well, a, an extreme example of one at the moment we've got is a parent who's just newly referred to the school. The, the daughter, uh, she's about six or seven. She arrived, she said, uh, I'm a cat. I don't speak to people. I don't come into any room, I'm just a cat. So, um, and the mother said, uh, uh, I can come to you, but I must run. I, I run marathons. So she, I, can, I can afford to be with you for half an hour a day. And so we're in the middle of doing a deal with her as to how much she will run and how much time. And we can see, we can see instantly the level of disconnect and what problems there are there to, to work on. But, so it's, it's a negotiation, I think, is the, the answer. But the, it's not a... Um, from a school's point of view, the, the director or heads uh, will be putting pressure on the family to say, we've done all that we can. If, uh, if, we don't, if you don't do something, then we don't know what else to do for your child. So there is often pressure on the parent to make a decision towards going towards the family, family class. Uh, it's, it's rare, well, I think it's once things are established, uh, then parents will choose to, to come. And it, it also depends on the age and stage of the child as well. We're doing, at the moment we're working at it in, a, in a regular school once a fortnight in the, another area of London. They were struggling with their, um, there was a new school and they were struggling with their five and six year olds. That, that, um, so they wanted us to go in and help to set up some family, family-based group work, and uh, we did um, our second group just, just last week. And uh, with five and six-year-olds, there was suddenly 13 parents turned up for the group, and uh, uh, 13 parents, 13 children, two babies, three, three, three-year-olds. So. <laughs> We have to organise it a bit better in future, but in terms of their enthusiasm for doing it, it was clearly there. And it's easier at that age, because you've got at that age of a, for families, ages and stages, developmentally, uh, parents have, are more focused on, the, on their little ones. And as they get older, again, you're linking to societal pressures in any country as to, uh, through the primary stage, parents are more involved, but gradually less involved where they moves towards independence comes and uh, the later ages, the 11, 12, 13 upwards, and it's more towards the individuation and autonomy and independence. So families are, to some extent, moving that direction towards children being um, autonomous, and schools are working on the same principle as well. But yet we still have children and young people who are acting in a less mature way and have not made the moves towards individuation and autonomy. So, so you can then still move and bring groups together in those circumstances as well. So that in all these things, there's many factors in, in, in involved. But, uh, um, I think the, what, again, one of the other questions you might come to think about is about, um, do you do, uh, do you run fixed term groups or do you run continual, uh, so what we call slow open groups? But there's pros and cons of, of those as well. So if you, if you run a fixed term group of say 10, 12 weeks, then that's quite neat because you have an established cohort from the beginning. You, it's quite uh, neat to research the beginning and an end. You can do outcomes quite well. Um, disadvantage of that is it's some families take longer to engage and longer to trust in children. So you can often be getting to week nine and somebody's only just starting to talk or think or have some confidence in the process. And you decide, they have to decide what to do from then on. 
or you can do the model that I prefer particularly which is the slow open group where the group becomes part of the school system um, so it becomes part of the regular um, pastoral system of the school whatever the, the therapeutic process of the school and um, then you've got the process Brenda was talking about where parents um, you, you, know, you, you maybe struggle a bit to get a cohort of people to begin with but then once you have and you've got different people at different stages of change those who have um, got, got to the end of their change and are ready to move on they are brilliant at engaging the next families along because your motivation or hope is also part of it so if a parent comes to a group and says well I, I, I can see you and, well what happens very much is that new parents come they're a bit nervous, but they, we pair them up with somebody who's more experienced, and they gain some confidence from that. But also the parent who is further on in their change, or the parent and child who are further on in their change, that they will uh, um, gain something from telling their stories or their experience of change to the newer families. And the more experienced families actually recognize their own changes, because they see, I was where you were uh, six months, two, two months ago, and I can now um, feel more confident in what uh, uh, my own experience. Uh, whilst they're still messing around there, I'll yeah. <laughs> the um, the other another crucial feature, again in this process of engagement of families, is once you've had a group established for a while, you'll be looking for a parent or parents who have had a good experience. Uh, and who you could co-opt to be a, a joint group leader with you. So, uh, so they become like a para leader alongside you, uh, which is again multiple benefits. It's good for them because it can be a transitional move uh, from the group and give them a, giving somebody a position of some responsibility and some respect for their achievement it's magnificent for you as a group leader because if you have a parent who's gone through the process they can uh, they know the children and families in their community far better than I do um, in the English system I'd be clearly as I am a, a white middle class older male and I don't live in the same housing as uh, a lot of the families who attend our groups so if I have a friend uh, who uh, knows the process of the group who can um, say, well, well, it happened to me a few weeks ago, I was, I was doing my best to um, persuade a mother to join a group, and uh, she was looking at me and very sceptical, I think, well, who are you? You, know, you, you, you would say that, wouldn't you? you, 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 you uh, why should I believe you? And again, this issue of trust. So uh, I'd, I'd been going for about half an hour, and I knew I wasn't getting very far, and then my partner, my parent partner came in and uh, she said the parent I was talking to talked to her for a couple of minutes and the questions were um, did you come to this group yes why did you come to this group because my boy was struggling in school and he was thinking about committing suicide was it any good yes why because he's fine now he's back in school he's, he's happy and settled Oh, all right. I'll come. <laughs> so, it's, you know, it's like any of us. If you if you go to something and or somebody tells you a, a film or a play or a shop is good, then you're more likely. If somebody is a good worker. You're more likely to go. So, uh, again, that's what we were saying before about the um, what what things go to help a, a group get established over time. So the slow open sort of group with people coming and going all the time is quite good. I think it's a good, good structure. Uh, I remember in Denmark uh, with the same question was asked and uh, and at least in Gladsaxe the, the idea was that <coughs> with the family class it was uh, three uh, hours uh, once a week. So it was one morning once a week. and. Uh, and they said they don't, didn't have really any difficulties with that. With the family school, where you were saying it's three uh, full days in a way, in a week, 
the, the thing was that almost all, if not all, of the par of the families had one parent unemployed. So, in a way, it was uh, that it didn't turn out to be a problem because this person, in fact, found a, <coughs> a way of, of using their their days in very uh, fruitful ways. You also find um, the question because again the fundamental of the, the theory is a child with a problem, you're looking for a significant fam what the family shape is, you're looking for a family member and uh, you, so if you find the one you're talking about, somebody who's not working, one is working uh, but you can also find, as my terms a, a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt, you're looking for a significant family member to attend with the, with the child or young person um, and that exploration or all you're thinking about is Okay, I've got that person who will connect to the group. Uh, who else do I need to find out about? Who else might become involved? Who else might I uh, engage at some stage? So some things are done. You're not in a rush. You don't have to hurry to uh, uh, try and solve things in one go because it's a it's a continual program. It's unlike well, it, it, it's it's similar to therapy in the sense that when. Um, I first learned from, again, I don't know if you've heard of them, the original uh, family therapist, the Italian uh, Milan group. There's um, a team there that were some of the founders of one model of therapy called Boscolo and Chiquin. And they came to our workplace and said that the um, first thing that you ever do when you're seeing a family, your ambition with working with a family is to get a second session. So your first session is to get a second. And it's the same in a, a family group. They, you know, uh, you know that um, you're going to see them, your aim is to see them over time. And I think one of the panics that sometimes people have when starting a group is to think, well, there's so many things going on at the same time. How do I, how can I possibly attend to everything at one go? And you don't. You, you know that you are um, going to see the patterns re reproducing time after time. Families will present themselves and how they do things that week after week, so you'll, you'll spot certain things at different times. Um, what about the background of the children? There are similarities in that. <laughs> the, back, the background of the children, were similarities uh, in... Um, in terms of problems, it's uh, the list that we put up there, which is... Um, um, okay, so one problem that you could face that we haven't really solved is how to move beyond just the naughty boy syndrome. So in schools, uh, teachers will tend to refer the more acting out style behaviours, the, the children who cause the school the most problems, that's in, 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 certainly in our system. Um, so to how to we do get them, but how, certainly in our school we get them, how to encourage through the group work um, accessing some more, a more balanced population of children with a range of problems, so the acting out, the conduct style behaviours, as well as the anxiety, depression, stress, um, other sorts of more well-being worrying behaviours. So that's a question that I think we all face when working with, with them around schools. Uh, because naturally, from a teacher's point of view, the, the child that comes to the top of your list when saying, we've got a family group or a family class established, who would you like to get some help? Well, I want him, him, him. And the him is, is often quite common. The, unless, unless it's measured or, or, or controlled to some extent, the ratio, as far as I've seen, boys to girls is about six to one in England. So six boys to one girl, which represents more of the, uh, the norm of a percentage of uh, boys who are uh, um, under that would be the under the heading of more um, control issue style behaviours. So I think, um, but the, the issue, another issue that gets raised sometimes is a question: Can it uh, can the groups be helpful for children in special schools? And yes, they can. We've run set up groups all over the world for children who are in special schools for all sorts of. Uh, conditions or situations. Um, and again, the principle of that is very straightforward. Again, if you've got a child who has complex difficulties, 
in whatever the diagnosis. It, again, it can be quite a lonely process for a parent or family and can be very um, disorganizing and distressing and uh, has a massive impact on the family. The, the parents, and they'll often go through difficulties or the uh, siblings will have difficulties in relation to that. So you know, any of you know, the people around the room who've worked in those territories will know that. And so to bring a group of parents together in those circumstances is a fantastic resource. But again, for the idea of uh, providing mutual support uh, at, at its very minimal. And we've had in uh, the English system, there are some very inclusive primary schools, or so schools where there are children with uh, quite a wide range of difficulties included in a regular primary school. So, I don't know if it's happened in Finland yet, but I know it's happening, it's happened in Denmark and Germany where there's been a big inclusion agenda. And there certainly was in England quite a number of years ago. And so where well, you know, the resources from the special schools haven't always been put into the main the regular schools as much as was promised. So schools have had to adapt and modify as best they can. But we've run family groups in there with a range of difficulties within any group in what would be classed as a, a regular school. And the, the, in terms of the first T of our model, targets, targets, planning, and action, reflection, and transfer, the targets are different for each child. They're bespoke. They're designed on whatever is the challenges for that young person. Um, one of the children we saw not so long ago who was pretty far on, on the autistic spectrum and he was in a group with other children who were, would be classed as not having the same level of difficulties. And his challenge was to sit on the chair for 30 seconds or to go up from 15 seconds to 30 seconds. And could he maintain eye contact for three seconds as opposed to one second? So it's all, it's all those sort of things you're adapting to whatever is, is relevant for the particular child, our family, and uh, the context of their being. Would my computer be any good just to confuse the thing? Because it's on mine as well. Uh, something must be staring down the other end of the table. There must be some. <laughs> must be some questions. <laughs> Maybe it's coming on the film, but um, I'm interested about to know about uh, the sessions itself. Yeah. Who worked there and what kind of topics and how did it go on? The facts, but we'll, they are there. We'll, we will show you some examples. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks. They are. Oh, you've got it. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Now you tell us. I'll continue with the answer for that while it's still messing around. Um, they, they, we have put a, a, a range of examples of activities that you can do. They're, they're, it is a, a group, say we were a group, we would sit, to people, parents come together, you can either have parents on their own for a little while, where you're talking about how you're going to plan the session, or you can have parents and children together to start with to plan the session, so there's a, a planning phase. What is hot today? What's important? What do we need to think about? Uh, they, they, all the children will have had targets negotiated previously between themselves, their parents and their teachers, so know exactly what they're trying to work on. But sometimes things have been different and uh, a child has had an argument with their parent on the way to school or there's been a, something happened overnight. So you want to pick on something that's hot, so that you're getting the session going. So our learning from that was originally that uh, if you left it just as everybody come in and just do something, you'd miss out on what some, some things that were important. And also parents would sit back and expect you just to do everything magic for them. So it's trying to engage the group in something active and purposeful. And the action is um, designed to create a context so that relationships can become obvious. They have 
uh, uh, Brenda put up a, a bit saying about uh, poor mentalizing. Uh, I, those I don't know how many know, people know about mentalization. Is it, you heard of that? Yeah, there's some nods around her. So a lot of our work is, is linked to mentalization, which also links to some things that are very relevant to classrooms. So uh, talking about perspective taking, uh, impact awareness, uh, curiosity, um, and playfulness is one key element that doesn't get talked about a lot. But playfulness is a, a central element of any of our group work. So uh, for many of our families, uh, play has got lost, playfulness has got lost, or many of our parents have never played or had a good time with their child. So the activities may well have a playfulness aspect to them. And then it's designed on purpose, so not only in the mentalizing, but um, we want a group where the children will want to come back to. So a lot of them have uh, had a lot of very difficult things happen in their lives and may, through the school, have had a hard time with uh, teachers and their peers where things have not felt so good. I can hear some music in the background, so I'm getting more, I'm getting more optimistic. Uh, I feel like I've been the, 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 the stand-up before the warm-up. <laughs> How did I do? Was that all right? Make any sense at all. Okay, um, so this is um, uh, just a, a, a film of a school that is part of you know, I, I can say, yeah, it's, yeah, a, it, it's a regular school in an area of London. We tra they hadn't been trained for very long. They'd only been going about six weeks. So they were very kind and in, they said yes, they would be happy to volunteer too, to demonstrate their practice. So we put in as many elements as we could to demonstrate some of the processes. So this is a trailer, really, for the whole package, so it gives a bit of a description. Family group is a group we meet with teachers, parents and kids and we do some activities, we talk, we try to find solutions to some difficulties that the kids face. I need to ask you some questions for my family group. Can you please tell me something that I'm good at? If I'm feeling down, I always know that I can always go to you because we sort of had the same problem. Before uh, joining the family group, my daughter, she was a shy kid. Now she is open to give ideas and uh, to help other kids. If they get stuck on some activities, she can tell them how to do it. So she's more confident to talk and to help and to express herself. Human beings evolved to live in communities. Developing multifamily groups serves as a recreation of the village spirit, where we create a community that supports each other in raising each person within the community. This is a way to get parents and children together to work on things that they're finding difficult. And it's really fun. It's a fun way of doing it. The thing that's nice about family group is it's in an environment that the children and the parents are comfortable with. It's parents and children working together. And the children really like having their parents in school in that kind of fun environment. The reason it works is because we make the parents feel safe. You know, they're free to talk when they come, and we get parents involved, because eventually it's not us running the group, it's the parents running the group. I think it's allowed the parent to um, have a better connection with school. Um, I think they definitely feel that, that closer link with the school. Getting to hear weekly how the child's doing is really helpful, and that communication has improved. The parents are concerned that schools are making judgments about how they do, particularly if they've got a child who has got some behaviour issues in school or at home. So I think it just helps that the parents see school as being supportive and it's an environment that they feel safe in. I used to come to the school and I'd be like a friend because the teacher I know was coming for me. Yeah, every day was the same thing. I'd go to the school gate and I'd go, oh God, they're coming for me. So I'd be like a parent like that, that the teacher couldn't get me. <laughs> Because I just thought, no, I can't take it anymore, do you know what I mean? But I went to the group, gave it a go, and it did really help. Any parents out there with some uh, behaviour concerns, if you feel like you're the only one who got that child with this kind of behaviour. But when we meet with other parents, and they have some issues maybe more than your child, or similar to your child, you feel like, no, I'm not the only one. You really do see changes, um, both in the parent, in the child, and in the school system, I think. To see parents that you hold your breath, 
when they walk through into the entrance hall, or they ring you up and say, I need to come and talk to you, and you just have to go and have a cup of tea before they arrive, because you just know what's coming, to see them wanting to come in school and laughing and talking to each other and enjoying their children and enjoying communicating with staff, that is powerful. Even though we start out with the premise that it is the child that needs to change, we know that through the group, over time, there will come a moment when a parent says, oh, I get it now. If we're going to ask our children to change, then maybe we have to think about doing something different there as well. Change that I went through was becoming a person in my own right, not just a mother, knowing that I could help other families as well, give them the advice that I'd use on my children, basically, some tactics or some things that we could use. I think engagement is massive. They, they seem to like it. They seem to come week after week. Um, and they seem to get something from it, you know, um, otherwise they wouldn't come back. When we first started with the family group, we ended up with like six parents. Then we ended up with other parents that would just turn up on Tuesday. And it was, the parents just kept coming. It was amazing. When my son left the group, and I was, I was three months, he would come on and carry on helping, giving our parents advice. And that's basically what I was doing, to give me confidence. To think, hold on, I'm actually sitting here giving other parents advice. You know, give me a little boost as a mum and as a person. So that's when I thought, well, I can do something about this. And I went and got an MVQ2 childcare course. And I passed that with flying colours, and this is where I'm at now. The thing that attracted to me to the group was that it wasn't problem specific. So a lot of groups in the past I'd run might have been, you know, specifically for managing anger or anxiety groups. This was a group that actually allowed me to target a wide range of behaviours. So we have children maybe struggling with attention and concentration difficulties, children with ADHD, children with diagnosis of autism, children where there's maybe relational difficulties between parent and child, behaviour in the classroom, that kind of thing. But really a wide range. A family worker with three families is much more effective than a family worker with one mother or one child. It's that shared, the coming together, working together, that is really, really powerful and has to be seen to be believed. We can invest early on, we put back the resource into a school setting at the very beginning of when those presenting behaviours first surface. The long term gain is huge. Thank you for doing an event with me. With me. I want you to see if I can improve. I've seen a lot of progress with you, Ryan. You have been do, um, sitting so much better in your chair and on the carpet. Because when you've got the arms, you kick the ball over. But now when you get your the arms, you don't do that. You think I've improved on my spellings? Yeah. Since we were working together, I think, I think you've got better. I don't see you get told off so much for not doing your homework. There's been a study looking at the societal cost of mental health problems. The burden is actually 90%, 90% borne by schools. The solution has to be found in changing the way schools operate to deal with mental health problems more efficiently, to harness the energy that's in the children themselves, in the parents, and in the education system for both sides, schools and children and families benefiting. Welcome to this multi-family group in schools training. This program is designed to help you with the skills, knowledge and techniques for successfully setting up and running multi-family groups in schools.
Okay, shall we, uh, shall we start to talk together again? Reflections that we could uh, think about with you. What, what, what are you thinking? Got the mic down there now. I can see where it's got to. Again, if it, if it helps to say it in fin Finnish for somebody to translate for you, then that would be great. Okay, I can start. Thank you. Okay, we, we actually talk about it that we love the idea and it's worth of trying. It's kind of a how to submit it, and you should find the eager ones to try with the system. And if you have the guidance and the program ready for you, I think it's worth of the idea. Brilliant. Well, I, th I think, Brendan, I've been thinking about that, given it, your project that you're, you're going to go on, and, think, and re reflecting back on how things have developed in different countries, because I uh, have to say that Denmark was really the, the the practice ground for doing this, because it, um, having gone there so many years ago, and then it, uh, thinking about how did it develop there, and it was, I think, in retrospect, it probably was there were there were sep there were different communes who, and uh, we certainly spent a lot of time uh, in Helsingør, uh, working there to start with, and uh, so there was a team there that were dedicatedly wanting to develop it across their commune. And so that was a bit, um, you know, however that that happened because there were a keen group of people who came to visit us at the, the Marlborough 
uh, family service and uh, put a lot of effort in wanting to establish it in their local local commune. And then it gradually spread across commune by commune as, they, as different areas got interested. So, uh, and where it has gone well, I think it has been uh, that there are uh, dedicated groups of enthusiasts who, who work with it to start with. I know that when we've been uh, we're, we're spending more time spreading the word in England, uh, so it's, it's moving out to different areas of the UK. And the same process happens, I think you've got to, as you're saying quite rightly, you need a, a dedicated team of, team of enthusiasts to uh, establish it in one area or two, well, however you do, one, two, three, four, however many areas, and then uh, the, the word will, will spread. Um, I think the risk uh, that Brent and I shared is the idea of um, when we, I think we can do quite well is go and um, inspire uh, sort of enthusiasm for the model. And if people take the inspiration but don't actually get the grounding and what the processes are, then they may go away and uh, uh, be excited about doing it, but then uh, get stuck quite quickly with uh, feeling despondent if a family doesn't show or there's some there's an argument or something doesn't happen so well. So it, it, it's that there has to be some care on what structures I put in place to. Um, create mutual support for the workers who are going to, um, given the jobs of uh, developing the program. Um, what's been happening more in Denmark is that, as you were saying, we were due to be in, at their annual conference. So there's an annual conference now of multifamily workers, which is, uh, which is good. That's been growing each year. So there is a dedicated team of people again who are coordinating. We know that there is the same in Germany, it's actually getting established to give to the families who are thinking to think about it. So, and within, and you, you were saying you used to be a, a teacher of a primary school, so I know that we know where it works well in schools and the, the schools, uh, I don't know how well functioning yours, well, we know from the international league tables that uh, everything tells us that everything is perfect in Finland, so in the education system. <laughs> but uh, I guess that might not be the full story from different areas, but the, um, for a, a group to go well in a school or in a family class or whichever way you want to do it, family school, it needs to be within a very uh, sound, within a sound senior leadership team where the management of the school and uh, know what's going into the school and support the whole um, principle of what, of what it's about. Because um, what you know, again our ambition, um, even though we're not Scandinavian, Scandinavian, our ambition is to improve the community um, aspect of the work, that the creating a successful group is like creating a better connection within a small community for a lot of our families. Say our original premise that they, they are often isolated and separated. You're connecting them back into society. So there's that aspect of it, but within the school there's a crucial element that the, all the staff should know what is happening. And not only the staff of the, where the children, the class of the children are coming from, but because um, your ambition is to try and influence the thinking and practice of your regular teachers as well. So it's quite a grand ambition. You're trying to change a child or a group of children who are causing the school and society quite a lot of problems but, and doing it by thinking in a, just a child in family context but also a child in family in groups of family context but also to influence the thinking of colleagues across the school system to be thinking in more systemic ways, um, more family oriented ways. So that is promoted in many ways through the group process. The basic way is through the target setting system. So the targets are established um, via the conversation with the person who originally has the most problem for the, with the child, usually the class teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else did you see? Well, I think there's I would like to say about um, uh, Although we have the new curriculum in the Finnish school system now, 
uh, there's a pol polarization going on in our society and uh, the differences between uh, children can be quite big uh, even uh, then when they arrive the school system and uh, I uh, and much is done already before <laughs> they uh, gain the school age but uh, uh, I think that uh, this family school would be possibility to uh, yes to yes 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 mm. I'm also thinking about it being relevant for the younger age range of the, yeah, yeah, I yes I was thinking so that yeah. uh, uh, for the, the younger, the better. There's, there's no question that that is uh, going to lead to the most benefit uh, for the school, but also it's actually easier to do. It's, it's the easiest group to work with. And, and that is probably self-evident. And uh, bringing families into the society, like, like on the film Peter Fonagy mentioned, I, I am reminded of a film from Germany, which we saw in London, where where, where this was used as a way of, of uh, helping um, migrant and refugee people, parents and, and children, to be become a part of the society. So that the parents were coming into the school, children, of course, refugee children and, and uh, um, children from, from foreign cultures start to go to Finnish schools immediately. But often, especially the mothers, they, they don't learn Finnish for years, maybe ever. And, and this having, having the, this kind of a family group where the parents were being taught by the children to, to learn German as a part of the whole thing, that was, yeah. uh, in a way, I think this has great strength in, in creating small uh, natural communities. And I don't think that there is anything stronger for, for um, the, the well-being of children and families than to feel a part of a community. Right. So, mm, traditionally, Finnish school systems have have concentrated on on the on the academic uh, way. Uh, no, not not when we go to to see what is written on the on your pages. It is very uh, this kind of. Um, total integrated picture of, of, of childhood but there is this other perspective where teachers uh, are supposed not to go in too deeply into the family issues and into into other issues one reason being that our teachers if I understand right are paid for the lessons they give not for like in Sweden or in Denmark where they are paid for the hours they put into school so in that sense, this, there might be a specific difficulty here. I'm not sure. Maybe you, you who are, are working in this field, you, you would know. But, uh, but having a teacher as a part of it, and not, not only some you know, uh, psychologist coming from outside, but, uh, but having, having teachers there is such a relevant part of this group. And, and I, I would be interested in, in hearing how, how this could be done in, in the Finnish system. Gathering the, um, the thoughts on that, we've had to face something similar in, in the UK. It's not so much that the teachers are paid for the lessons, so they, they are paid to be in the school, but the head teachers are very much less willing to release teachers for anything other than teaching. So they, they are definite. We, we don't see teachers anywhere near so much as we used to do. So it is the other members of the school staff who have well, um, being given responsibility for other aspects of the children's lives. That's who we mostly work with now in terms of school. Like social workers or psychologists or counselors or mentors or there's all Teachers sorts of... Teachers that have the pastoral responsibility? Yeah. We have. So uh, when I was a teacher in school, I taught... Yeah. I, when I was a teacher in school, I taught English history, but I also had a class that were my class that I was responsible for. So that was my pastoral, my care side. And I think everybody understood that within the school, unless the, um, the, the care of the child was monitored and the child felt that they belonged, you couldn't get optimum learning. So I think that there is a discussion to be had with teachers, however they're paid, 
if you want to get your pupils in your class to a certain academic level, then the mind of the child has got to be free to learn. And that maybe is some technique that as teachers we could benefit from so that when you're part of the family class you learn some of that technique or you gather your vulnerable pupils into the class knowing that that will raise the standard of your class. So I think it's an interesting discussion as to the mind of the teacher, <laughs> keeping the mind of the child uh, and, and what technique you can bring within your profession. It doesn't matter to us. I mean, it matters that the change is, is transferred from the group into the classroom. So all it requires is to think is what is the vehicle for that to happen. Who's going to be the, the carrier of the change and how is that, what communication systems are put up for that to happen. So targets are uh, very clearly uh, a simple way of doing that, but whatever uh, communication loops are needed and we, we will use all sorts of things our schools with email systems, our email systems with this, this, so that events in the classroom with a child where they go right or they go wrong, they, they are, they, they, that information is transferred via the group to home and then back into the classroom again. So it's only a technical issue about how, uh, who's going to be the main carrier or holder of the change process in the classroom. If the teacher isn't available, then somebody else will need to be. But the teacher, as Brenda says, needs in the long run to be the person who notices it if they, if they are going to um, witness and support the change that the child is going through in order that their learning continues at a better pace than previously. So it should be fascinating to see what mm -hmm. Shall we just go through a bit more of the theory to see if it matches where your thing will be? Um, I want to, okay, so structure, I think Neil's talked about while we were trying to get the, the thing to set up. You can have a, a two and a half hour session once a week with somebody that has some expertise in how the mind of the child might benefit from different techniques, different beliefs, different interventions. And somebody that's very much part of the learning environment of the school, working together in a partnership with the parents. So that's the easiest way. And it's basically a room, and we've worked in loads of different spaces. Uh, and uh, I don't know what it would be in Finnish, but in English, you need a good cup of tea to go alongside it. I don't know. Is it coffee? Is it? Mm, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> but something that says this is a place that feels like home. Okay. So a different organization structure that we know they've done in Germany uh, and some in um, uh, uh, Denmark is that you might have two or three sessions during the week, or you might have a day, which is the multi-family day, once every two weeks. You're just structuring a time where the families can attend and that they know that's dedicated time to think about improving their child's uh, state of mind and their learning. And again, trying to get somebody from the system of the school and somebody from the um, helping system, a social worker, uh, a psychologist, as you saw in the film, somebody who would support the families. Um, so this is one of the underpinning structures that you would be working with, but why bringing the families in? <laughs> Thinking that most of the children that come are very distrustful of adults. So if we think that we are biologically trained to scan for risk, if we don't feel secure, then the children that we're talking about come into class already checking out, is this an okay place? Do I, do I trust the teacher asks me to, to sit down and do my work? Or am I just checking? What does that mean? What does she want? What, what kind of mood is she in today? So children who have had their trust betrayed some point in their life do find it very difficult just to just get on. So if they haven't got that um, attachment security, they're not quite sure how to read others. They're not quite sure how others read them. They will spend more time in the class before they settle, where other children straight to whatever we ask them to do. So that learnt trust isn't there. 
because sometimes they would get in their early days uh, a feedback that felt okay, that feels reliable, and other times it might be nobody was there for them or they got a very harsh feedback from them. Uh, if I give you an example, we can see this all the time in our school. Some days a child may fall over and the parent may say, oh, come here, that looks painful. Other days it's, I told you, don't wear those shoes. So that's a very different feedback. So what's reliable, what's not reliable? So if they don't have that reliable trust, then their social skills are not so advanced as the other children, because that's where we learn all our social skills. And I'm going to come to that as our, um, that's our curriculum for the class. And in those social skills, finds it divides into two areas that we work with. One is the self-regulation. How do I manage my excitement? How do I manage my anxiety? How do I manage my feeling of I'm doing okay or he's doing better than me? All of those emotional churns that we have every day in our lives, which will feed through to their management of attention and, and their internal state control. Also, the interpersonal skills. Many of our children um, apparently say to our parents, are, are, you, are you angry? And the mums will say, no, no, I'm just concentrating. But they're not able to have a really decent, reliable template for how to read an adult state. So they're consciously anxious about that. So if they don't have those interpersonal skills, if I can't read you and I don't know how you're reading me, then that is really difficult for me when I'm making relationships or I know how to behave in the class. So I'm a little bit disabled or blinded by the fact I don't have those skills. And so we know that if our children are to do well in school and have good mental health later on, those are the areas that we need to work on. And I'll explain a little bit more. Does, is that making any sense for you? Yeah, good. OK. So the, the epistemic trust, um, absolutely. Our children are constantly checking their parents. Is this OK? Is this person OK? Am I doing OK? Um, and what we found in the group is we have to spend quite a lot of time helping support the parents' sense of self. So if we're going to support these children, we need to support the parents. So I think we are feeling in all sorts of ways like a grandparent most of the time, parenting the parents so they can parent the children. And what that means is just being reliable and keeping up with the motivation, warmth and trust agenda. Seconds more on our epistemic trust. So again, it's uh, something again that's come out of uh, mentalization. So it's uh, Fonagy's um, favourite um, reference point at the moment, and it and it is the form of trust. That people talk about it as a, a basic trust, but it isn't something that's innate. It's a form of trust that grows through the attachment relationship, basically, through through every child and as the attachment drive and drive to, to connect and to attach to the adult. And through that process, that's more or less successful, as we know, in terms of secure attachment or, or the different forms of attachment. If it works well, then the child is gradually developing this thing called epistemic trust, where adults are seen to be trustworthy and reliable. And again, for those children where it goes well, then they, uh, it follows through into the education sphere. That's why it's relevant for us. If child trusts their parent or their primary caregiver and have got good epistemic trust, then they will go into the classroom and feel, this is secure, I know you, you're a, you're a trusted adult, I can learn from you. And it's the ones that we're worried about who haven't had the good attachment, haven't had good epistemic trust, who go into a classroom and see the teacher and think, who are you? I don't trust you. And they're permanently on alert, watching around for, for everything. So it's, it's quite a key concept for I think what we'd like to say in terms of the training is that there's been a lot of thought over all these 30 years as to what's the science that's gone into this. So by the time we come round to showing you what the plan is, I'd like you to feel confident that underneath this, what seems like quite a simple plan, there's been a, a lot of thought and research to make sure that this is going to help those children 
can make the, the progress both in their mental health and education. And a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Mistakes, yeah. So we have a very simple system, starting with trying to help people with their motivation, their targets. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be academically? Where do you want to be socially? And just picking up the point about parents helping each other, um, a lot of our parents in our groups, as you can see, that English is not their first language. And one of the things that they have found uh, talking to each other, a part of their, part of their, well, the, the oh, maybe it's not. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Just going back to that point about parents not having English as a first language. It has played out uh, incredibly in terms of security. So some of our parents have said that they used to sit at home and just be incredibly worried about their children when they were out on the streets because they didn't speak English, they didn't have friends. Now what they do is within the family group, they will phone each other, they will text each other. Have you seen my child? You know, what, what's happening? Uh, and yes, I will have children in my house tonight, your house tomorrow night. So that community has helped keep children safe as well. Of breaking down prejudice, quite honestly, because London is quite a diverse population, and uh, so there have been quite a, probably more years of practice than you've had in terms of uh, more migrants coming in uh, to the country. Um, but uh, our group still do offer quite a lot to break down prejudice between different cultures, and so it's more than the language teaching or the language learning stuff, uh, people becoming more familiar with each other's cultures and uh, um, valuing difference as much as anything else. So we try and set out targets, you imagine that, and we can show you different ways that we do that with the children, trying to get the motivation. And that each, each week we will have a planning phase. What, what do we want to work on? What, do we might, what skills do we want to develop? And we train parents to begin to feel comfortable and confident to name skills in each other's children as well as their own because parents are pretty good at being able to have a good relationship with somebody else's child because your own child touches your buttons and somebody else's child doesn't. So once you've built a, a circle of trust, parents are very good at saying, but your child, she's lovely when she reads to me, but maybe she needs a little bit more confidence to join in. So they begin to identify what the next steps might be for each other. And then we'll have an action phase, which is a a playful or a learning phase where really we can see beliefs and behaviors in action rather than just what people tell us and that's really helpful to think about what we need to target for change and then building in a reflection what have we learned from this and then the transfer where are we going to see those skills so you'll see that in action we'll show you another bit of film in a minute um, again just to, to <coughs> emphasize um, I think it should be self-evident, but it, it, it's definitely a model where we believe in change. So we're not just maintaining or managing children's behavior. It's somewhere where it's designed to be uh, supportive and warm and um, with motivation. But there definitely has to be a, a, a challenge in there that we're trying to bring about change so that things can improve and move on. And that uh, is a a powerful driver for everything we're thinking. You've come to this group, how can we make it purposeful for you, for the child and parent? So it's not just come and have a good time and a chat, it's thinking what needs to, what crucial things are not working so well that we can uh, actually uh, work on together to bring about I'm change. so much English. You're too much. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll be quicker and then we'll show you a bit more film because I think I might bring it to life a bit. In the first weeks, this planning, action, reflection, transfer, um, to get the group running, you're going to spend much more time on the action phase. Children want to come, they want to play games, they want to have something that's exciting, uh, and you have less capacity in the group to reflect. By your own modeling, as the group goes on, you're going to be able to build in more and more reflection time, much more confidence in being able to talk about what you've seen, what does that tell you. And we use a, a, a kind of nurtured heart approach where we will be saying, I noticed that you, know, you sat so beautifully, you were really focused. You, you, I forgot, I forgot what I was going to say. 
Uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, you sat so beautifully, you were really focused. That tells me that you're a very thoughtful and creative person. So, in terms of the feedback that we put within the group, okay. I'm not touching any of you. <laughs> you're, you're fading, Brenda. I know. I've got a red light now. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the, the feedback that we're trying to put within the group, as we build that reflection, what we advise parents to do, and we demonstrate it ourselves, um, is to be able to spot something in each other's children, to give the evidence for it, and then attach a virtue or a characteristic for it. I'm going to just shout. <laughs> uh, no, the reason is that's for, the, for the feeling. Yeah. Uh, so probably the battery is low. I've learned. So if this wait one more time and tell me some coffee. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll give it coffee. Okay. Coffee is actually really good for motivating, yeah. Um, so we, the, in terms of bringing this idea of warmth into it, we've noticed that Sometimes children do something well, and the parents or the teacher may say, "Oh yeah, well done, good, good, good." You yeah. faded again. I, I, I think it's, it's coffee time, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but then you have to add a virtue. <laughs> virtue being coffee. Yeah. A virtue or a characteristic. Otherwise, last thing, it's just like a bit like fast food. It just goes through, and children don't have a good view of themselves. So in the reflection. And the families will start to demonstrate that. Let's have coffee and then we'll show it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is a pretty self-evident diagram, but one of, you know, many of us feel that uh, life should be as in the top part of the diagram. Uh, our plan is that, but uh, talking with our families, that it, it's a recognition that life isn't so smooth always things uh, there are many challenges one of the um, key recent developments really of our practice has been looking at higher order cognitions um, which has come from research that has been done at University College London and at Yale about um, based on a adult mental health that many uh, adults whatever their mental health condition have got poor representative representation of higher order cognitions if we look at the so the higher order cognitions um i think and you'll probably know this better than i do but there's something like p scales or p skills so that that whatever mental health condition that adults have that they um have been seen to have poor uh, performance on these higher order cognitions, which are uh, categorized into eight different uh, elements, which for any of us as human beings in, in uh, our families or in life in general, need to have a good enough number of these or good enough uh, spread of these skills to be able to function adequately in life and in relationship to others. So for us to focus on them uh, through the uh, family class or the family group has been crucial. Again, it's um, from our way of thinking to really emphasize the notion of being purposeful, that the group is not just a place where people will come together and have a nice talk together and where the development of community is all. So having said development of community is important, uh, parents want to know what am I doing by being here? What am I actually learning? What, what is the point of this? What is everything underpinned by? So uh, as we, I read them down, that the, many of our children have very poor impulse control. We've already said that, that they, uh, we've got our, our parents and children to define it in their language. They may say inappropriate things and en engage in risky behavior. So it's again, all of us can think of many children that we've uh, struggled with in, in our classes and uh, they don't think before acting. Emotional control, uh, they can overreact and find criticism hard. Again, these things apply to both the children and parents in our groups often, but uh, need to 
focused on those flexible thinking adjust to the unexpected and those children may get frustrated and think about being asked to think about something new or from a different angle so they've always come with their over rigidified styles of thinking uh, working memory obvious um, self-monitoring judging how they're doing can they be I think children who we know can be surprised by getting a bad mark or a bad report so they're not able to actually judge how well they're doing at any one time um, planning and prioritizing and can't really chaotic, chaotic children who present in relation to their work or practice in more chaotic ways they're not very good at organizing themselves or uh, you know it's most simple children and one of our children who uh, they go to the local park, park for a break time and um, he came back, he hadn't got his coat, he hadn't got his jacket. So the debate was not so much as to what he had done not to remember his jacket, but whose fault was it that his jacket happened to be left at the park. It was uh, what member of staff's responsibility was. That was actually the mother's perspective, that somebody else should have done it for him. So this. Um, Task initiation, getting started. Many children find it difficult to get started, as uh, many adults do as well. And uh, adult, this is a good one for me. Organisation can lose their train of thought as well as uh, clothing and homework. So it's similar to the one to before. So um, we've shifted our thinking I th to be more skill focused, and it's helpful, I think, for parents when talking with parents that. The, um, rather than talking in mental health terms, rather than saying um, that there are difficulties in terms of their emotional well-being, is what skills do we need, does your child lack, or ch what skills can we help your child to develop in order that they can be more successful, happier, and more settled in school and in your family. It seems to sit more easily as a, an accessible way of talking. And it's just something that you said about how do you persuade uh, your colleagues in schools that this is a good idea. I think the column on the right hand side there about um, overreact, finding criticism hard, not having a good mindset, not being organized. Most teachers would like the children that are failing to thrive to have a lot more of those skills. And if family group is a training ground for those skills, and at home a practice ground for reinforcing those skills and then underneath that we know that those are the skills that will help those children with their resilience and their capacity to have good mental health then you've got all that captured in maybe an eight-week program or you can have a group that goes over many 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 weeks and you'll just keep coming back to those main themes from time to time so that's your pathway that you're plotting for each child so in some of our groups we might do impulse control for three weeks we might do games that are linked to impulse control we have some reflection they may be the targets that those children are setting or it may be that it's about organization or working memory but at least it gives that group a defined progress purpose Does that makes sense yeah so, uh, i think in terms of uh, your what your looking like you're trying to develop an integrated health and education and social care program it actually fits with that very well that the idea that if the, the hypothesis is that adults need to have these higher order cognitions to be healthy and well then if we are trying to build a program that uh, supports the development of those skills in young people it follows that it is likely uh, to lead to better emotional and mental health when they get through to adulthood. So there's the crossover, in, as we're always thinking about, in the integrated education and mental health curriculum. This uh, represents um, part of our curriculum, but it, 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 it represents one of the points that was on an earlier slide about crossover between parents and children. One of the things that we find, found a long time ago by, again by, um, it was by practice really, was when we were meeting with a group of parents and children together uh, and they were, the parents were particularly frustrated one day with their children 
And they said, oh, I know what we'd do. Why don't we switch over children? You take my child, I'll take your child, and then, then life will be a lot better. So we actually played with that idea and uh, practiced that with them in small ways within our group, and then developed the practice as more routine part of the group, where parents will work with somebody else's child rather than their own, and in all sorts of different parts of the activities that we do. And now that is backed by, um, and there's all sorts of theories you can connect it to, but it, the, the most simple aspect is that a parent comes with their own child with their own dominant pattern. So parents know what their child will do and the child knows what they will do. So families will have their usual style of eating together, uh, talking together, falling out together or not. So it's very, all of us could think about our own family and think what's a predictable argument that we might have if we go home tonight or in the morning, whatever. So every family has its own predictable patterns. And so the same, that happens when families come for therapy. They present their pattern to you as a therapist and try and convince you that their pattern is a correct pattern. And there's a tangle between the therapist and the family. So, well, you think your pattern's wonderful, how do you want to change? So, um, what we're doing in the group is, in, exemplified by this, is putting this parent who has her pattern with her son, Mohammed, uh, which is one way, and what's the name? Um, Chardonnay, who has a pattern with her family. Um, they don't know each other's patterns. So by placing people together to, in relation to some task, there is, a, in the therapeutic sense, of a chance of something different happening. It's not saying the parent is going to be better or magically change something, but something different may happen in the, through the event. There may be some new learning or some new experience of each other. If we put it that uh, this parent uh, has had a hard time with her son and doesn't feel at all successful, which is quite common and feels anxious or upset about her relationship with him, if she has a relationship with her which is more successful or pleasant or uh, enjoyable, then it will give her a different experience of herself, similarly from Chardonnay's point of view. Um, Chardonnay is this young girl, her mum is in prison. So she doesn't have a family at the moment, so she's looked after. So again, that will be perturbing some thoughts in her as she uh, talks with this other mum. It's actually done in a very, in this instance, very simply around uh, reading. So one of the pieces of evidence is that uh, children learn more successfully how to read if they're taught by their parents and teachers. That's been shown in some studies. So, um, and for our parents, this is in our school, our, our family school, uh, we encourage the parents to read with other people's children and then to uh, the parents will also have some input into actual techniques or, uh, of how children learn to read. So the English system about phonics and how, what sounds are. So they become experts in reading. So you've got an intensive aspect of the straightforward learning curriculum but there are some psychological relational activities that go alongside it and hence we're trying to describe a, a pretty integrated therapeutic and educational curriculum. I think the main um, ambition when you're just trying to use this as part of your family group is to introduce difference and so if you put the same parent with the same child the whole time you're not introducing the difference that might make the difference so you may have had a planning session where you're identifying uh, different aspects of the child that you want to, to improve, and then you might do a little bit of reading, swapping over parents and children, and then you might get them to come back and say, how, how was that? What did they learn from each other? So action doesn't always have to be games. It can be reading at times or something that's quite academically focused. Um, how should we skip those for now? Okay. Um, when you've got your planning together, uh, you are trying to develop a eye of the group or the community to keep each other's children in mind and how they're doing things. And one way that we found of doing that is by, as you saw earlier, giving every child a little flip camera and saying to them, go and find three adults that you trust and find out from them what you do well and what could be even better if. 
And that's where they might go and they ask the dinner lady or their teacher or their friend. Uh, and so the next thing is just showing that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, in this instance, the, this is the, from our training pack. Uh, just an example of one of the uh, small uh, units now about how to gather targets. Brenda says you can, we can do the regular sit around system of uh, organizing targets where parents, teacher, key teacher and child sit together to discuss what things are going well and what things are not going so well, and what things need to change. So you get uh, three or four key elements of the, in child friendly language that is need to change in order that the child can be settled back more in class. So everybody has a point of view. That's a, a regular, normal way of doing it. This is a different way of doing it, which is using the camera system. And the child would, um, being more uh, involved in the process of developing their own targets, because there is a risk in any, of, uh, any process of promoting change where families are involved. Is that <coughs> it can be adult focused, where adults are doing change to children. So how do we involve the child in this? Uh, so in this we've got uh, two of the children going, re-interviewing the parents who they had first of all interviewed and are presenting their tape back to the group. So again, it's a multiple reflection. They get a reflection from their person they interviewed, but also the group think about it as well. Okay, so welcome everybody to week five. Uh, this week we're going to be watching a bit of video. We've had um, Ryan and Erin uh, out on, on report. You've been uh, interviewing, haven't you? You've been interviewing uh, some, some people in school to hear about how, um, how things have been going, uh, hear what people have noticed, um, and just get some feedback really from, uh, from the progress that they've seen over the last five weeks. So we're going to watch that all together and then we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Okay? Have you seen anything that I've improved uh, since I last interviewed you? Yes, Erin, your behaviour's improved. Um, the way you um, settle um, arguments with your friends. Um, for instance, the other day when Rachel was annoying you, she seemed to be annoying you. Um, and instead of shouting at her, you were talking to her calmly. And then you resolved the situation. That was much better. Have I improved on my chatting have i stopped or have i gained more no your chatting in the lunch hall has definitely improved as well you tend to eat your dinner a bit quicker now and go outside and chat with your friends which is good okay i'm glad you think i'm improving do you think there's something else i can work on as well um the only other thing i think you could work on Aaron, is trying to make your circle of friends a bit bigger because you tend to play or hang around with the same people all the time. So if you made other friendships with other people, that'd be quite good. Do you think that any of my other friends have re uh, seen a difference? I definitely think the people that you argue with um, have seen a difference in you. Um, like I say, the, the way that you solve problems now and um, end arguments they also tend to calm down. They obviously don't shout as much either. So yeah, I think you, you've been a positive um, model to look towards them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep going Erin. Keep going where you are. Um, and yeah, you're doing really well. Thank you, Miss Banks, for your time. I hope you have a lovely day. Okay, so we're going to review what Miss Banks said. And if everybody's not sure what Miss Banks is, she's the senior dinner lady. So she said that Erin's behaviour is better. She is talking more calmly, not chatting so much in the dining hall. So she was really impressed with your behaviour at the moment. So you've really made some good changes there. Mm. And then the one that she says that you still need to improve is trying to make your circle of friends bigger. Has anyone else kind of felt that that they would like to make more friends so it'd be nice to make more friends Ryan you're nodding yeah mm -hmm. so that's something that other people have felt that really I only have one so it's nice to sometimes uh, uh, make friends with different people new people but sometimes it's quite tricky too right 
about how, how we can make our friendship it's group. Nice new friends. It is lovely making new friends, isn't it? Brooklyn, do you have any ideas? Yeah. Be nice to them. Mm-hmm. And don't if they're upset, don't push them or do nothing but do not be friends with them because when do I Do you want got, to tell Aaron? When I got friends, I only had one and then I got loads because when we used to be nice to each other and then we've been being friends all the time. So then you grew your, you, you started being nice to more people yeah. and then you became, you got a bigger group of friends. Lovely. Ryan, Ryan, do you have any ideas? You, you can, go, if you see um, someone crying, you can come up to them and ask yes. them if they're okay. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's really important, isn't it? Like Amira was saying, if someone's sad, um, so being a good friend would be maybe comforting them. Lovely. And uh, Yusra, we've got a... Yusra, would you like to tell Aaron an idea too? So if you see some, someone by um, themselves, you can go and ask if you have any friends. And if they say no, you can say, um, you can be my friend. Then you start talking to each other and say, what's your name? Then you'll be best friends. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's nice. So noticing if someone's on their own maybe and going up to them and taking the first step. Erin, how does all that sound to you? There's some really nice ideas there. What do you think? I think it sounds good because that could really help me make new friends and not stick with the same person all the time. Mm. Okay, so we're just going to watch. Um, so Erin was interviewing, was it your friend? Yeah. yeah? So we've got um, an interview with Erin's friend to hear a bit about what she's noticed. So we're going to watch that now. So, hi Demi, thanks for joining me again. Remember when I last interviewed you? Yeah. About my behaviour and everything? Yeah. How do you think I've improved? Well, I'll start here. I think you have improved when I said you're about your behaviour in class when you were chatting. You've definitely made an improvement on that. And with friendship as well, you have stopped, you, we keep secrets and you do not tell anyone. Do you think I've improved by not getting into any more arguments? Yes, Erin, I do think you've improved. And you've improved by, if someone else is having an argument, but to other people, you, you, te you, you tend to walk away from it so you don't get involved, which is a good thing. Yeah. Okay, Demi, I'm trying to get better at things. Do you think there's anything else I could improve on? Yes, and it is, well, if somebody else tells you a secret, don't come telling me if it's about me, because I don't want you to get in an argument. So, thank you, Miss, for agreeing to do another interview with me. That's okay. Um, so, what do you think I've improved since I last interviewed you? Well, you've been focusing a lot more on the carpet, listening to your teacher, and I can see you're understanding that more to do with the work, because you have been listening. And uh, when there's a problem, do you think that I get more involved, or I go and tell a teacher or a dim lady? I can see you've been going to tell the teacher, and you haven't been in as many arguments as you did before family group. I can see that's really helped you with that. Thank you, Miss. I'm glad you can see a difference. Um, do you think that if I was to change my attitude more towards work and start listening more carefully, I will be able to finish my work and get it all right? Definitely. When you focus more and you've got really good attention, you'll be able to finish your work and it'd be really good because you know what you're doing. Okay, okay thank you, Miss. Do you, think that, do you think there's anything else I can work on over the next few weeks? 
Well, I think you're, the focusing is really good, but I think to be even better, when you're doing your work, you need to stay focused the whole time and follow it through. So finish your whole piece of work for that lesson. Okay. Okay, thank you, Miss. I'll really try and do it and um, complete all my work. Okay, so we just saw um, Erin speaking to her friend Demi. Um, so Demi said that she'd noticed uh, definitely that Erin was chatting less uh, in class. Yeah, is that right? Chatting less and uh, so um, kind of getting on with stuff. And, and she was also talking about friendships. And she'd noticed that um, you were kind of calmer with your friends, but also that um, you, were, you, were, you, had, you were keeping secret or not kind of chatting with lots of friends about what other people have said. And she'd noticed that you were walking away as well. So when there was arguments, you weren't getting involved and you were walking away. Um, so some really great things that she'd noticed. Um, have, have you noticed these things, Mum? Yes, I have. Um, I don't get Erin after school saying that I've had a row with this person, I've had a row with, I've walked oh. away. So yeah, I've noticed a lot of change in her. And Erin, what's that like for you then? What, um, how it, how, how, you know, what's good about that? What's good about not rowing with friends? That make, what, what's that make the school day like? It's you? good because then I don't feel so grumpy mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I need to hit something or anything. So you're feeling less, less angry? Yeah. And, really and, and, uh, and if you're feeling less angry, what, um, what does that mean then? Does that make your day better? Yeah. And do you find that you're getting more friends now? Yeah. So that's another good thing. So you're making new friends. Okay. Have any of the um, the other parents got any comments about what um, about Erin's uh, progress and what what um, what they've heard just now? Well, I'm really pleased with the progress you've done. You've done really well. Everyone's happy with the way you've changed. So that's good. Yeah. Great. Forward. Any anyone else? Any other mums? Um, I'm happy for you, Erin, for all that positive feedback coming from your teachers and um, your friends um, and um, I mean um, I'm going to keep it up yeah, yeah. Well, done. Really well. well done so you're going to maybe give it a go and try some of these ideas this week yeah I think we need to give Erin a clap yeah fantastic <laughs> for that wonderful reporting and then for trying out some new ideas I think uh, we're going to give Erin a, a wow card mm -hmm. yeah, yeah? Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay, well done. Okay, so we're going to go on to Ryan now. Um, Ryan spent some time interviewing his teacher, I think it was. So we're going to hear from his class teacher about how things have been going uh, and what she's noticed, what she's been impressed by, um, and then we'll, we'll have another chat once we've watched the video. Yeah? Thank you for doing an interview with me. I want you to see if I've improved. I've seen a lot of progress with you, Ryan. You have been do, um, sitting so much better in your chair and on the carpet. Thank you. Have I done uh, anything else better? You've been able to do a lot more work by staying focused. Um, it's a better improvement in your handwriting as well, where you're staying still, which is good to see. Okay. Is there anything else that I should improve on? Um, I think you can improve on putting your hand up more during lesson times, so I know that you understand what you're doing and any questions you have to ask. <laughs> you're welcome. It's lovely to see your progress. Is there anything that I've improved? Yeah, because when you got the arms, you kick it all over, but now when you get the arms, you don't do that. Have do you think I've improved on my spellings? Yeah. Since we were working together, I think, I think you've got better. I don't see you get told off so much for not doing your homework. Thank you, George. Is there anything else that I can improve on? Um, maybe shouting. What do you mean, shouting? When when the teacher tells you off, you shout across the classroom. George, thank you very much with your help. That's fine, I'm happy to help. 
That's great. So you're going to grind a big clap. Okay, okay. So shall we review? Yeah. Okay. So Miss Sanford said that you've made a lot of progress. Also, you're sitting in your chair a lot better. You're improving your handwriting, and that's because you're sitting properly. Um, and then George said it's he's noticed that you don't get the hump so much, and you're not getting told off so much in class because you haven't done your homework. And then he also said your target now should be for not shouting. And Miss Sanford said to put your hand up more in class. So really. He's done a good job. Yeah, Mum, what do you think about all of that progress he's made? I'm very happy. He's actually doing his homework now. Um, oh. It was before I couldn't get him to do it at all. Um, we had to have class time during the week where he did homework. Now he's doing um, it at home. He is, I'm very happy. And he's bringing it in every week? Yes. Yeah. On time as well. Well done. Oh, well wow, done. that definitely deserves a clap. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then just thinking, picking up on a couple of things that they mentioned. So um, maybe some things to work on uh, would be putting up your hand more in class and asking when you when you need help um, and not shouting out. What what do other children? What ideas do you have about helping Ryan to put up his hand more in class? Yes, sir. Um, you can like tell your partner that sits next to you in the table. Um, to like to remind you not to shout out. If like Miss asks a question before she asks the question, when she asks the question, um, just like somebody to remind him, put your hand up if you know what the question is. She was giving a really good suggestion of kind of maybe a buddy helping you out and reminding you to put your hand up. So that's a great idea. Does Amir Amira's got an idea. Ryan, you are you listening to Amira's idea now? Good boy. When the teacher um, reminds him, he'll get so much better. Ah, and, okay. and, and he will um, listen to the teacher nicely, mm -hmm. and, he will, and he will not look in his chair. Okay. Or he won't talk to somebody next to him. And when he sits in the carpet, mm -hmm. and he won't talk to any friends, he, only, he will only listen to you. But sometimes that, that's quite tricky. What, what, could, what could help Ryan to maybe um, do more of that? Stay focused and concentrate to oh, the teacher. Good girl, wow. Ryan, some great ideas coming out. Did you hear that? So just trying to stay, just trying to stay focused and concentrate and listening to what the teacher's saying. And yeah. listen to your friends wow. and teacher. Yeah, friends. trying not to listen to people around. And it's okay. playtime, you're only allowed to listen to your friends. Okay, great. And Erin's got an idea, Ryan. Are you ready to listen to Erin? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If you need a little bit more help, help with your homework, you can also get a homework buddy. So you can get one of your friends to come over help you with the homework. Yeah, homework buddy sounds great. Does anyone else have a homework buddy? Yustra, do you have a homework buddy? My mum. Oh, mum's your homework buddy. That sounds great. Good. So I think all of this deserves a very big clap for Ryan. You did great. So Amira's going to go and give Ryan a wow card because of all the improvements, all the hard work he's been doing over the past few weeks. Well done. Should we give another clap? Well done. Okay, I mean, <clears throat> within that, um, there are some regular um, multifamily processes, which uh, it, they're not because that's one particular sequence that are in play. The we have got a child reporting something from their peer group, so you're using the peer-to-peer -peer aspect, peer, peer mentoring style. I must just by in, in brackets say, if you don't recognise what um, what George was saying about, I, I don't I don't see you get the hump anymore. I'm sure that doesn't translate to Finnish. The hump is when you I don't see you getting angry. It's just a child's way of saying when you. 
I don't see you getting angry at me anymore and kicking the ball over the fence. So it's that sort of thing. But it's it's the peer, a lot of the peer to peer work is quite important. So um, what the group leader um, there, Syra, was doing, she was obviously leading the group, but trying to promote conversations across the group. So information came to her, and she would redirect it to go from child to child, or adult to child, or adult to adult. And that's what you're trying to do in terms of forming group cohesion. Um, you know that you are central at certain times, but there's other times when you're trying to get out of the way to create the, the relationship between people. Uh, the other thing in terms of um, each of the children were gathering information which was reporting some change. So they had been reinforced by uh, filming it, which is actually, when talking to young people, it's quite interesting how filming something is different from just doing face-to-face. -face. They're more removed from the actual process of the relationship, so there's some something to learn about that. But also then replaying the film to a group uh, where they get multiple reinforcement again for their, their change. So you're looking at things being reinforced by other children, other parents. But you're also within a, a, a larger multiple family group. You're getting parents who are not being targeted at that moment, who are watching somebody else's child and parent who are in the focus, where they'll be taking some lessons for themselves. So even if you're not aiming at one, somebody else will be thinking, what does that mean for me and my child, or me and my family, or me and my parent? So it's a, uh, um, whereas if you are, as uh, traditionally been done, being a, a therapist or a counselor going into school, working with one family or one child and family, you're often only as good as that, that, that session or that sequence of sessions has been. So you, you may have had a great time with one child and family and brought about change, but it doesn't have any knock-on effect for anybody else. So that's why the group is brilliant for that. Um, it was lovely looking at your faces while the children were talking, <laughs> because in terms of them being able to have a reliable feedback system, you know, your faces did it all. And I think that the value of having people like yourselves with maybe families where a parent is depressed or anxious who might not be able to give the same relaxed, open and reliable feedback that I saw in all your faces is enormous. And also the parents, as you give that same smile or open feedback to them, they will glow and grow in that and in turn able to give it to their children as well. So. Your role in it is twofold. One is that you keep the plan going. We're going to now get a plan, see what every child needs to achieve. Then we're going to do some action. We're going to maybe play a game or we're going to do a piece of schoolwork. And then we're going to reflect on it and think about where are we going to show that in the next week. But on top of that, you as living proof of people that can tune into children and help shape their brains. Uh, is incredibly important. We have other film, but it's on your machine. your machine. I got some more, but they're not. Um, and just here, we're just looking at um, the other crossover. So they've been making food in this this bit of uh, picture here. And as I said already, Chardonnay's mum is in prison at the moment. And as the family, the far, the group of families create this group ethos, they start to do a shared parenting. Uh, and as so Chardonnay made terrific progress in our family group, even though she was looked after and uh, was parented very much by other parents who whose children were in turn being parented by somebody else. And uh, as you can see, mums get really, really interested in, this is uh, rethinking ADHD, I don't know what he was doing reading that, but um, this is another mum who's getting really very, very keen and interested in discussing this with him uh, and other parents talking around. But that's what happens in the group, there's massive energy for curiosity, if we get that right, and that's why I think it's perfect in the school system. Um, we have another thing which we may talk about another time, which is our smart gym, which is a, a development of that. So within the family group, we're bringing together now bits of equipment. Um, this particular bit is very easy. It's a, 
um, a fit lights where you have to change things out in sequence and it really does train children on situational awareness and things but maybe that's for another time it'd be wonderful if we can show you one more bit is it in it's yours take a, a second or two. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's another chance for conversation and uh, questions yeah I'm going to come back to the yeah just so to be really clear then what you've seen is the children go away and get their own targets from film and we did that because when we started the teacher and the parent used to identify three or four things they wanted the child to change but it seemed like a conversation that was happening between the adults and a lot of the research about mental health has led us to think that there's an hour expression in England of no decision about me without me, that if you can keep children at the centre, then you're likely to get a better outcome. So by using the film technique, um, we get children to feel like they've been part of identifying. And that idea of researching change rather than I am this and that's the end of it um, has been quite important. So you can get your targets so that every child might have two or three targets towards that kind of where do we want to be in six weeks time some future thinking and then what are we going to do today we thought that we might work on for example one thing we do is um, uh, we get the families to make a group portrait where we would ask you all to have a piece of paper put your name on the piece of paper and then you pass it around and then the next person has your name and you draw the face then you draw the eyes the nose and by the end we've got a, a kind of picture of, of everybody in the group that's made up of all the different bits um, and <laughs> they're usually quite wonderful paintings anyway but they give us a lot of opportunity to talk about reading faces so we had a group for example with a, m a set of mums where there had been a lot of domestic violence and so the mums started saying it's quite hard to read if somebody's face is genuine. You've got to see that the eyes are smiling, otherwise it might not be a real smile. And the children were saying, yes, I can see when my mum's happy. Now, most children would say, yeah, they're, they're, their face, you know, their, their lips go up and their eyes sparkle. But these children were amazing. It's like, they got a dimple here and the frown is here. They went into massive detail, which then allowed us to talk to the parents afterwards about how much does your child think about you, worry about you, check up on you? Um, so from a very simple action technique, our reflection was in two ways. One, to talk with the families about how do you read people and how do people know if you're happy or not. And the other was, uh, with parents' coffee afterwards, how much do your children worry about you? How much do you recognize that they are scanning you the whole time? And how are you recovering from that? Um, so that's that's in the planning action reflection. If we can find it, what have you found which here? One, which one are you thinking about? Now? I don't mind either the, um, the Lego, one Lego one. yeah. Oh. Another one is um, if we can show this, it's uh, an activity where we get parents and children with the crossover again in the action. Um, each child and each parent would have the, exactly the same pieces of Lego exactly <laughs> made the mistake sometimes with not being exactly and then you have a, a book in the middle of you and the child has to make something and describe it and the parent has to tune in and listen then we have an aha -ha moment and we have the reveal and then afterwards we have a talk about how difficult it is to listen and communicate so a, a speaking and listening action <laughs> hey well done all right could you move that please neil <laughs> <laughs> Looks extremely serious and extremely tired. Shape or build something with the Lego that they've got. So 
they might have to start with a blue one and then they might put the green one on top. But they have to describe it because um, you walk, you can't see each other because you've all got footprint away. So the children need to slowly and really carefully describe what they're building. And then mums, you need to build what you are listening to, so what you think that they're building. And the idea is to hopefully, when we reveal, they'll be the same. Does that make sense? Have I explained that okay? Yeah, do you have any questions about the task? Um, it's because like from the start, you might kind of just make sure we be specific when you tell the child like that was really good work. Really good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yes, so some of them you might have like a, a dark, oh here we go, Keith got one, haven't you, Amira? Dark green and a light green. So you'd have to specify which one you, you could just say green because mums would be confused, wouldn't they? So um, you'd have to say, I'm using the dark green or I'm using the light green. Yeah, but that's great. Um, yeah, okay, is that, is that all right? I think just before we get started, um, I'm, I'm just going to get Miss Alison to remind us what our super targets are for the time being that we've got. So Ryan, yours is to sit still for more than five minutes. So no moving about, okay? Erin, yours is not talking when others are talking. I will be giving you the talking now. <laughs> Yudra, not rocking on your chair. So we'll be looking at that. Amira, ask for help, put up my hand. So if you need any help with the colours or the shapes, then we'll come over and help you. Brooklyn, put your hand up and not shout out. So if you need any help, we'll watch for that hand, okay? Everybody happy? Okay, let's go. When the activity is underway, try to move around the room, watching and listening, and particularly taking note of how relationships between the parents and children are working as they carry out the task. This sort of activity is perfect for switching over parents and children so that everyone starts to get a chance to experience a new relationship with someone else's child or parent. Doing this early in the life of the group really helps to build a sense of togetherness and mutual support. You will be continuing to notice any new behaviours starting to emerge. Right.
Mm -hmm. In your partnership, allocate the roles of process manager and context manager. The context manager sets up and runs the activity and maintains the pace and direction for the session. The process manager has the task of keeping the children's targets for that session in mind. They encourage and praise when small steps to change are observed. The process manager can also encourage children to work with a new and different parent in the action phase. Try to always include a parent in the conversation when you speak to a child. Encourage the use of ideas or skills from within the group when problems arise for parents or children. Try to avoid the invitation to give expert or personal advice. Encourage positive comments. Make sure that the role of context manager and process manager are clearly defined. Make sure you leave time for reflection and transfer, that is, what have we learnt and where will we practice new skills and who with? Okay, so very simple, but again, as the action is taking place, it should give you an opportunity to have conversation. Even a very simple thing, like some children, like Brooklyn there, whose mum had lots of other children, really liked the fact that I had mum to myself during this time, and that was an important point for, for him coming to the group. Um, we might just show you one more and then probably drowned you enough with now bits of film. So this is uh, should be a little bit. Yeah, this is the portrait that I just Let's talked about. I'll move it forward to the portraits, and then I'll show you how we get that conversation going off the portraits. This is the most fun day ever, she said. Of course it is. <laughs> that is knowing how to read people and situations and also being aware of how people may read you are key skills for helping children thrive in schools. We will see with this activity that creating composite portraits is excellent for facilitating discussion on how you read people as well as leading to discussions on such skills as perspective taking, curiosity, turn taking and impact awareness. Usually a chatty exercise and sometimes we've used colour and in our multicultural thing people are testing, so what colour is your skin? So it really develops a kind of group cohesion uh, and a curiosity, otherwise people stay in their own little worlds and this is trying to begin to build trust in the group. Notice how by this week seven stage, the adults and children are much easier with each other and need little encouragement from the group leaders to fully commit to the activity and are more confident in talking with each other.
Do you imagine doing this with the children or families that you work with? Would you do this? Yeah? Yeah. No, we do have fathers in our other groups. We have fathers, we have grandfathers. Just on this day, we've only had mothers. What have you done to your men? who's available, who you can get. Yeah. In your thinking, you're thinking who's missing. You're always thinking who else might we involve at some stage. I think as a basis, it, it's starting from the premise of the, you, again, you get the child and a key adult, but you're trying to develop the trust in order that that adult will want to bring the other adults, rather than the standard family therapy model say, bring all the key adults. You, you're not requiring it to be, be, begin with. You, you build up to it through developing the trusting relationships. And, and then uh, people do show up. And again, make the commitment by taking their hour off work or coming in their lunchtime or doing special deals with their bosses to um, find time to get to the group. <clears throat> you also get uh, couples who are separating or who have separated where they may take it in turns to come. The father may come, the mother may come. It's again you're getting different perspectives each time depending who's there. You do get some wonderful portraits. We quite often put these portraits together and make a postcard. Okay, so, we're gonna do the final so you make a group postcard which we send out between groups where we say we noticed last week that you did a fantastic job when you, you know, helped somebody who was feeling upset. And we love the way that you are so thoughtful. I'm really looking forward to seeing you next week, which kind of keeps the message going uh, on the positive, but also reminds busy families that there is the group next week to come to, and you're warming up the system. And uh, families have told us they really appreciate that, that they put those on their fridge and it's a positive that comes into the home. This is now the what's big class as their reflection phase. Again, it, it, you can see where it goes to. It leads to, because you're thinking about, you've done your, you've done your planning, you've got decided what you're doing, you've done your action, which is the portrait. Then there has to be the reflection phase, where you're making something of it. <clears throat> and in this example, it's clearly about facial recognition of, and how do you read emotions. So it goes back to the higher order cognitions. That's what you, what's driving it, of the emotional control. And a lot of our children have got parents who've either living with domestic violence or. Uh, drink or drugs or harm in different ways. So we have children describing to their own parent what they see, which can be quite revealing. Also for other parents to hear what children are seeing, because again in um, families where there are uh, there's a lot of violence, often the parents will assume that the children are blind and deaf and don't see or hear, hear anything, which we know is absolute nonsense. So to bring that out into the open through a school-based activity we're bringing key family relational issues to the fore in a safe environment is uh, uh, often immensely powerful. We had a, a 
one boy in a group doing the same activity, the portrait one, and he was, they were talking about how do you recognize if uh, facial expression, expressions are genuine or not. And there was a discussion that uh, if somebody smiles uh, it's, uh, and it's only around the mouth, then that doesn't count. You have to be able to tell a, a true smile if the eyes are really smiling. So it's quite a sophisticated discussion about uh, trusting uh, facial expressions. And one of the children was then saying, uh, can you tell whether your mum's happy or sad? And he went through every detail on her face, whether she a dimple on her cheek or on her chin, and whether her eyebrows did this. So, and she was absolutely amazed, but because you know, she was somebody who went into episodes of depression and sitting on the stairs and deciding whether to take tablets or not. So he was ultimately aware uh, of what, what was going on for her. So it's often, um, again, how to emphasize what, sim what seems often was what we presented on there, quite simple tasks, but they are vehicles for relationships to become apparent. And you can, and this is a, I say it's a regular school, uh, the children got some degree of problems, they, they would be classed as early intervention, so they're not really uh, high, necessarily highly complex, but you, you can attend to those in order to head off difficulties, and then you can raise the level of complexity depending on what what configuration of group you're trying to establish. And say in our, I can reassure you in terms of the portrait one, we've used the portraits in our school, which are, I would say, as, given that we worked in the health service for so long, <coughs> with uh, child and adolescent mental health uh, problems being referred, the children that we see in our school are more complex than we ever saw through the health service. So they are the ones that don't actually go to clinics and are seen there the ones that are known in social care, uh, known to social care, and uh, who are struggling. We've, so we've done, actually done the portraits with our really uh, complex conduct, heavy conduct disorder, young children, the five, six, and seven-year-olds. And I saw them last Wednesday during the day. They held that sort of focus and the concentration for about half an hour on that task. So if it'll work there, it'll work anywhere. The transfer bit and the the speed date format, and I think that's enough delving in. This is just one idea of how you get the transfer to make it active rather than just chatting. So you want the idea that we've learnt something in the group and how are we going to transfer that and how are we going to see it in action either at home or at school. So this is using our speed date format where you get the parents sitting in the middle, I think, on this one, and the children on the outside. Again, with the idea of changing context allows the brain to stay fresh. Uh, and the children are being asked to imagine, to mentalize, what it might be like for their parent to get a call home from the teacher to say, your daughter or son has had a great day. This is what's happened. So you're trying to future think. So we're getting the children to make that call, uh, and we hope that they will be able to see the expression on their parents' faces or other people's, which will and kind of encode what it means. You want children to be able to, as well as parents keep their children in mind, parent children to be able to keep other people in mind as well. So you're trying to enhance that in their neural networks. So you have to discuss before months what will I be called in you about? What would that phone call be? To say they've done absolutely amazing today. The speedy format adds pace and direction to this transfer exercise. Imagine the state of mind of their teacher and parent. And this future thinking starts to help a child to keep their parent in mind when they're in lessons. Imagining a phone call home invites an excitement to the prospect of a better relationship experience if effort is put into achieving their goals.
enough, isn't it? So that should give you a taste for some of the material that's in the training package. Um, all the way through, uh, behind that, the, uh, the trainee can then click onto the reading material, so there's reading material to back it up. So there's the film, there's voiceover, there's checklists, but then there's a separate reading, which is... Your manual. Yeah, I'll and, and I'll just give you a little glimpse of the manual as well, because that just takes you through week by week, you know, what activity you can do in week one, week two, week three, a little bit of the materials that you can use, and if you're interested, a little bit of the theoretical background that goes with it. And you can have children all aged together, or you can have children of two, three, four year age gap. Depends on what context you want to capture. And that's the manual. Yeah, so you get your manual, our lifetime's work, all in one online training, <laughs> a couple of Skype phone calls. Yeah. Every section's got all the background. It's in English, I'm afraid, but apart from that. I'm trying to get it translated in German, but we'll then finish with the next. Uh huh, okay. English is okay. Okay. Swedish comes next year. It tells you all about different versions of target settings. Do you have an idea? When I was looking at the Swedish target settings, they tend to concentrate in the south. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we did some training in. Um, get this right in Gothenburg, Gothenburg. Um, but we did have people who came down from the north and so there was a lovely story of um, them almost having multi-family in, in a moving bus that went around the villages and um, doing it because there were times in which the children didn't go to school, they were at home because they were tasked to do with reindeer and stuff that they needed to do. Yeah, and so um, they created a kind of moving family group uh, which picked up some of that stuff for children in that time. So very creative. Um, we kept I think thinking we want to go and see it. Again, I think our job is to tell you or tell people of the basic, uh, mm. what the basic principles are and some, some of the key um, forms of practice that will be helpful across any group. But then it's thinking for you, of your particular context, you know, is it is it a once a week? Is it three times a week? Are you aiming for a full family school like ours? What what degree? What level of intervention are you looking for? And what are the fertile territories to get something established? So I think you know, you know, I've said it before, but if you get two or three going, then that will start to generate the the enthusiasm across the country, I guess. We we were thinking about you and wondering the lessons that we've learned from Germany and and Sweden and from Switzerland, what would work. And it seems to be that if you can establish five or six beacon sites, and they um, are then the people that go on to support and develop and train others, that seems to be our best way of working. Because uh, definitely in 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 Denmark, we had 
in different bits of the country because different bits of the country had different pressures on parents and families. And so to develop that and then to share with a network um, all the games that we did, all the um, new ideas that worked for the different groups and putting them onto a, a sort of a, not quite a WhatsApp group, but a, an email group so that lessons learnt from one group were shared with something else. I mean, the, the main premise, I think, behind it is, is sharing ideas and sharing success. Uh, it's not a, a model of license in the terms of, you know, you need to be, you need, you need support and training to get it going and lessons learnt from other people, but really, um, we'd like to think that well, we're offering something to the expertise you have already, uh, which is just another context for helping families that are a little shy of getting engaged, a little anxious about uh, professional involvement, but do want something good for their children. Yeah, again, the why you've done it and we've done it is, uh, I think, is to work on the basic assumption that most parents, and despite the often vast number of pressures they've got on them, want something good for their child's education. So in a sense, that's what our hook is. You know, it's, it's saying that's what uh, engages parents' interests in the first place. And uh, we've said all the way through, trying to find a normalized way of intervening. So is it a time for? So, yeah, 25, questions. Now, 25 to four. Mm. Finish. Have a think. Two minute finish. Yeah, that'll be good.
Yeah. Okei, okay, hei. Um, kiitos. Meillä on enää muutama minuutti aikaa ja olisi tärkeää koota yhteen ajatuksia. Siis, um, so we just have a few minutes, but, but clearly there has been uh, eager and intense discussion. So I think you would like to, to reflect on a few ideas and then, uh, then I would give it over to, to our governmental uh, representative. <laughs> Mä sanon suomeksi, jos joku kääntää, kun vaikea sanoa noita kaikkia. Innostuttiin ideasta, vaikka ainakin itselläni oli lähtökohta se, että apua, että Englannissa kaikki äidit on kotiäitejä ja ne pääsee sinne kouluun, kun ajatus oli, että sinne tullaan joka päivä ja koko ajan ja pitkän aikaa. Haluaisit kääntää välillä joku? Sitten me mietittiin, innostuttiin Walterin kohdalla siinä, että kun meillä on tukijaksoja, oppilaita tulee kunnan koulusta meidän kouluun erilaisille tukijaksoille, niin tavallaan ottaa siihen jaksoille tavallaan jonkinnäköisiä perhejaksoja. Ja sitten kun me tehdään ohjausta kunnan kouluihin yksittäisten oppilaiden tai ryhmien osalta, niin voisi järjestää tällaista family groupia sinne omaan kouluun tietyn ajanjakson, vaikka kerran viikossa tai pari kertaa viikossa. You know, if you want change to happen, and it, it, it just happens quicker and more substantially if you engage the family in the process. So. Ja se mitä pohdittiin tässä, että meillä on nyt ryhmä ja tarvittaisi meidän päättäjille idea tästä ja joku pilotointiasia, mitä lähettäisiin viemään eteenpäin ja kokeilua, mitä voisi sitten lähteä jatkamaan eteenpäin ihan enemmänkin. Well, um, we dis discussed also that we definitely would need a, do we say, pilot mm -hmm. or some someone who tests and starts, and then it's going to develop, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, and, and I was saying that um, I'm arranging the national uh, conference for for child uh, education this spring, spring, and I said that right away when we have the pilot they will come out and 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 <laughs> explain what it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and 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 i <laughs> yeah and we definitely have to have it because i think this is a as a great system to support the child and the families and that's what we need for our schools right now and um I was since we are in in national agency for education we are also like uh, steering the money for the <laughs> for the schools and I think this is a a very good uh, system that if it would work I'm sure we will, would find funding for this to to later on to to because because it's also a cheap way to yes. to give uh, support and as you see there were two workers and and there were whole group of, of children because we we discussed earlier that we know that uh, students have their own therapies there and there and so on so why not to bring them all together because then they can kind of like uh, they get it all at once but i think it's, it's it's a really great system and and it's so so simple how come no nobody <laughs> nobody figured it out before because thank you very much <laughs> that's right <laughs> 
Yeah. They're, they're definitely, we were at a conference some years ago, and our headmaster, I think it was in Germany, said, this is such common sense. Yeah. Why are we it is, it yeah. is. And, and, and hopefully when you visit us next year, and you, you, we can say that, oh, yeah, we have that. It's just, it's just yeah. a... In every so because the, I'm just for the, um, the clue for you at the Valtteri schools that uh, when you do get going and you get asked to go to a conference, make sure that you take a parent or two with you. Because they, and again, part of the process of developing your pilot is if you get some change going, you, you're trying to co-opt a parent to be work alongside you. But you also, as soon as you get any change or any success, you get two or three parents to go and present to the rest of the school staff with you which you're trying to influence thinking everywhere. And parents will always be the most convincing. Uh, you can take students as well. They will also talk for you. It's that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and we also have some big other, other big programs uh, starting now uh, next year for the schools and, and support for schools. So I think this, this could be a tool that to go along with those bigger programs and, and to, I'm sure that this is something that we need. Um, when you've run your group the first time, you will find one or two parents who grow and they become parent graduates and they help you either seed another group somewhere else or they help recruit to the next group along because they are the living proof. And going back to the, the economy of it, um, we've had to prove to our government you know, what is the economy if we don't do something with these children, the social care, the mental health problems? But also, parents are a fantastic resource, and they don't cost anything. <laughs> and if you train parents and inspire parents, and parents want to give back and do something, and it adds to their, I don't know what you call it here, but you know, your, career, your, your CV, when you go to look for other jobs to say you've done that, um, uh, that is fantastic for the parent, but also good for the growth of the job. Uh, and what we've done, uh, you were saying about helping mainstream or other schools, um, we have been training now our parents, and our parents will go to help run groups and talk to groups of parents in the mainstream schools and help with the idea of creating peaceful classrooms uh, and helping other children in the group and helping the teachers reduce the low level of disruption in those classrooms by the techniques they've learned in family group. And that has meant that the teacher has gained this much more percentage of teaching time because the low level disruption has decreased. So once you've set up your group, I like your ambition that you'll help your mainstream teachers as well as your own experience with these more vulnerable families. But the investment in parents pays back, and we're talking to government enormously, in all ways. One more idea, if there's time. I, uh, I forgot my watch at home, so I don't know. Um, you mentioned it is, it is good for children and, and for families, and I would, in my logic, it is also good for schools and for our society. And, and, and one reason is that seeing these kids uh, asking their friends for feedback and, and learning to do it in a respectful way. Uh, I mean, they could be ones who would take this to their regular classrooms. That uh, it, it, This could be a culture of, of, yeah. of reflecting on what is special about you and giving good feedback. And then also asking, is there something else I could do? So, I mean, it, this is, I, I don't know whether you have experience with this. This could become mainstream. Oh, it, it definitely can. I mean, it, 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 the children who've been to our groups um, the norm would be that they would start off as non-talkers. They are children who grunt and, uh, and so on. So um, what you see from children, they do develop a different expertise, exactly what you want. They become better reflectors, and become more experts in, uh, in checking um, about emotions and feelings. And, it, and we will often um, persuade them to go back to their class to teach their, their, their peers some of the activities because you're always thinking about if they've been excluded a bit from their class and not been seen to be good if you put them back with some expertise it will be good for them but it will also be good for the rest of the class as well 
and through that to towards the uh, you you were saying good things about the Finnish education system. One of the things that is not uh, something that I think we should be very proud about is that uh, our kids don't often say that they like going to school. Uh, m- Swedish children are much more uh, reporting on on that school is fun than Finnish, and uh, uh, so you know, yeah. I, there's a lot to 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 work towards, and and this you know this kind of find finding more substance more depth into into interpersonal relations probably would make it much more more fun so in that sense i think it's it's good for the schools but now i think we'll have to uh, close and, and i want to thank you uh, immensely you were so so flexible i i was very uh, late in asking you because of all the um, stuff and 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 you were so generous you 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 came here for today first it was wednesday and thursday now it's tuesday and friday and uh, and, and 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 you you ask for nothing you just say that uh, this is so important for you and i think this also is a uh, testimony to to uh, that, that there's something that one should do because one is uh, feel strongly passionate about it and and you are very clearly this thank you very much for today thank you very much.